Once upon a time, in a lively classroom filled with curious students, there was a bright young boy named Ravi. His mind was always full of questions, and he was known for his eagerness to understand complex topics. One day, his teacher, famous for making the most difficult lessons easy to grasp through his storytelling, decided to introduce a new concept, Indus 1, the standard for the presentation of financial statements. The teacher began his lesson in his usual captivating manner, saying, Imagine, Ravi, you are the owner of a grand bookstore. It is not just any bookstore, it is the biggest and most loved bookstore in town. Now, at the end of each year, you need to tell your customers and investors how your bookstore is doing. Is it earning money, or are there challenges you need to overcome? For this, you need a clear way to present your financial story. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. But how do I tell that story, sir? The teacher smiled. Good question, Ravi. That's where Indus 1 comes in. Just like a well-written book has a beginning, a middle, and an end, your financial statements must follow a structured format. Indus 1 is the guide that tells you how to organize that information so anyone reading it can easily understand your business. Ravi's eyes sparkled with curiosity. So what should I include in this financial story? The teacher began to explain. Indus 1 tells you to start with a balance sheet. This is like the foundation of your story, where you show what your business owns and owes at a certain point in time. Think of it as your bookstore's financial position. Do you have more shelves full of books than you owe to the bank? That's what the balance sheet will reveal. He paused, giving Ravi a moment to absorb the idea, and continued, next comes the statement of profit and loss. This is where you tell how much your business has earned and spent during the year. Did people buy many books, or were sales slow? This statement will show whether your bookstore made a profit or a loss. Ravi nodded, following along. And is that all? The teacher chuckled, not quite, my eager student. After that, you present the cash flow statement. This part tells the story of how money moves in and out of your business. Did you receive cash from book sales, or did you pay out more to buy new stock? This is like the heartbeat of your bookstore, showing whether there's enough cash to keep it running smoothly. Ravi thought for a moment and asked, but what if my business grows, and I want to make it look good for investors? How can I do that in my statements? The teacher raised his hand and said, ah, that's an important point, Ravi. Indus 1 requires you to be truthful. You cannot hide information or make your business look better than it is. Everything must be presented fairly and clearly. Your readers, whether they are investors or customers, must trust what they see. Indus 1 is like the rules of a game, ensuring that everyone plays fairly. Ravi smiled, feeling like he was beginning to understand. So, Indus 1 is like a storytelling guide for my financial business, ensuring I present my bookstore's situation clearly and truthfully. The teacher nodded with pride. Exactly, Ravi. You've got it. Remember, just like in a great story, clarity and honesty are key. Indus 1 helps you paint a clear picture so that everyone knows how your bookstore is doing financially. Ravi left the classroom that day, feeling confident that he could now understand the importance of presenting financial statements properly, thanks to his teacher's unforgettable storytelling skills. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. One sunny afternoon, Ravi, the curious student, sat in the classroom, ready for another captivating lesson from his teacher, who was known far and wide for his storytelling magic. Today, the teacher had promised to explain a new concept, Indus 2, which deals with inventories. The teacher smiled as he began, Ravi, let us go back to your bookstore. Now, imagine your shelves are filled with books of all kinds. These books are your stock, or in accounting terms, your inventory. But have you ever wondered how to figure out how much this inventory is worth? Ravi's eyes lit up with curiosity. I have thought about that, sir. But how do I know how much my books are worth? The teacher nodded, happy that Ravi was asking the right questions. That's where Indus 2 comes in. It is the guide that helps businesses like yours figure out the value of their inventories. Think of it as a method to make sure you know the true worth of everything on your shelves. Ravi was intrigued. So, how do I calculate the value of my inventory, sir? The teacher leaned forward, as if about to share a secret. There are two main steps, Ravi. The first is to decide how much it cost you to bring the books to your store. This includes the price you paid to buy the books from the publisher, the transportation cost, and even the cost of storing them in your warehouse. Ravi's eyes widened as he realized how many factors were involved. So, I have to think about more than just the price of the book. The teacher nodded. Exactly. It's not just the price you pay for the book itself. You also need to think about the costs that are necessary to get those books ready to sell. That's the first part, figuring out the cost. Ravi thought for a moment and then asked, 
but what if the books are not selling well, or they've been on the shelf for too long? The teacher smiled knowingly. Ah, that brings us to the second part. Indus 2 tells us that after you calculate the cost, you have to compare it with something called the net realizable value. This is the amount you expect to sell the book for after considering any discounts or expenses to make the sale. If the net realizable value is lower than the cost, you have to reduce the value of your inventory. Ravi looked puzzled. Why would I reduce the value, sir? The teacher explained patiently, imagine a book that was popular last year but is no longer in demand. You bought it for a hundred rupees, but now, nobody wants to buy it for that price. You might have to sell it for 60 rupees just to clear space for new books. In this case, the net realizable value is lower than what you paid for it, so you have to reflect that in your accounts. Indus 2 ensures that your inventory is not overvalued, showing a more accurate picture of your business. Ravi nodded slowly. So, I need to value my books based on both the cost and the amount I can sell them for. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher said with a smile. And remember, Indus 2 doesn't let you add any unnecessary cost to your inventory. You can't include things like advertising or general administrative expenses, only the costs directly related to the books themselves, like buying, transporting, or storing them, should be included. Ravi thought for a moment and then asked, but why is this so important, sir? The teacher's expression became serious. It's important because inventory is a big part of your business's assets. If you overvalue your inventory, it might look like your business is doing better than it actually is. That can mislead people who want to invest in your bookstore or even affect your ability to make sound decisions. Indus 2 helps ensure that your inventory is valued correctly, so everyone knows the true picture of your business. Ravi smiled, feeling more confident. I understand now, sir. Indus 2 helps me figure out the true value of the books on my shelves, making sure I don't overestimate how much they are worth. The teacher nodded proudly. Well done, Ravi. Remember, just like a good story needs to be told truthfully, your inventory must be valued honestly. Indus 2 is there to help you stay on the right path, ensuring your bookstore's story is always accurate and fair. Ravi left the classroom that day with a clear understanding of how to handle his inventory, thanks to his teacher's unique ability to turn even the most complex accounting concepts into simple, memorable stories. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. One rainy afternoon, Ravi, the ever-curious student, sat in the classroom, watching the rain hit the window. He was deep in thought when his famous teacher walked in, ready to teach yet another important lesson. Today's topic was Indus 7, which covers the statement of cash flows. The teacher, known for turning complex concepts into fascinating stories, began in his usual way, Ravi, imagine the rain you are watching outside is like money coming in and out of your business. Some days, there is a steady downpour, and some days, the skies are clear. But whether it is raining or not, you need to know where your money is coming from and where it is going, right? Ravi nodded, intrigued. Yes, sir. But how do I track all that in my business? The teacher smiled, sensing Ravi's curiosity growing. Good question, Ravi. This is where Indus 7 comes into the picture. It helps you create a statement of cash flows, which is like a map showing how cash moves in and out of your business over a certain period. Ravi leaned in, eager to understand. So, how does this map work, sir? The teacher continued, let's break it down, Ravi. Imagine your bookstore again. There are three main paths that cash can follow in and out of your business. Indus 7 guides you to divide these into three categories, operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. Each of these shows a different part of your business's cash story. Ravi's eyes lit up. What do each of these paths mean, sir? The teacher smiled, happy with Ravi's engagement. Let's start with operating activities. This is the core of your business, the everyday things that bring in and send out cash. Think about the money you receive when customers buy books. That is cash coming in. But you also have to pay your employees, buy new books, and keep the lights on in your store. Those are examples of cash going out. Indus 7 helps you track these daily activities so you can see whether your business is making enough cash to keep running smoothly. Ravi nodded. So, this is like the lifeline of my bookstore, sir. The teacher's eyes gleamed with pride. Exactly, Ravi. Now, let us move to the second path, investing activities. This is where you show the cash used to buy long-term assets, like if you decide to buy more shelves or even open a new branch of your bookstore. It is also where you record any cash you receive from selling assets. For example, if you sold some old equipment, the money you get from that sale would be shown here. 
Ravi paused for a moment and asked, so, it is about the big changes in my business, right? The teacher nodded. Yes, these are usually one-time or infrequent events. They show whether you are investing in your business's future. Ravi's mind raced, thinking about how his bookstore might grow one day. And what about the last path, sir? The teacher leaned in closer, knowing this was the key to bringing it all together. The last path is financing activities. This is where you track the cash related to how you fund your business. If you take out a loan to expand your bookstore, the cash you receive from the loan goes here. Similarly, when you repay that loan, the cash going out is recorded here too. It also shows any money you give back to investors if your business has grown enough to pay dividends. Ravi's face lit up with understanding. So, the statement of cash flow shows me where the money in my business comes from and where it is going, right? Whether it is from everyday sales, big investments, or loans? The teacher smiled warmly. That's right, Ravi. And the best part is that by using Inda 7, you can see whether your business is healthy. For example, even if you are making a profit, if your operating activities are not bringing in enough cash, you might struggle to pay your bills. This statement helps you see the bigger picture of your business's cash position. Ravi thought for a moment, then asked, but why is this so important, sir? The teacher looked at Ravi thoughtfully. Imagine, Ravi, if your bookstore had a lot of money tied up in things like stock and equipment, but very little cash to pay your employees or buy new books. You could run into trouble, even if on paper it looks like your business is doing well. The statement of cash flows ensures that you are not only focusing on profits but also on the cash flow, which keeps your business alive. Ravi smiled, feeling the pieces come together. I get it now, sir. Inda 7 helps me keep track of all the cash that comes in and goes out, making sure I can see how my business is really doing. The teacher patted Ravi on the back. Well done, Ravi. Remember, just like rainwaters need to flow properly to avoid flooding, cash in your business needs to be managed well. Inda 7 helps you see where your cash is flowing, so your bookstore can thrive without any surprises. Ravi left the classroom that day with a clear understanding of how the statement of cash flows worked, thanks to his teacher's incredible storytelling that made even the most complex ideas seem simple. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright morning, Ravi entered the classroom with a sense of anticipation. Today was special, for his teacher, renowned for his enchanting storytelling abilities, was set to explain a new and intriguing topic, Indus 8, which deals with accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates, and errors. The teacher greeted the class with a warm smile, noticing Ravi's eager expression. Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to embark on a journey into the world of accounting, much like navigating through a forest with different paths. Each path represents a decision a business makes, and how it affects the financial story we tell. Ravi's curiosity was piqued. What do you mean by paths, sir? The teacher replied. Let's imagine that you are the owner of your beloved bookstore, Ravi. When you decide how to record the costs of your books or how to calculate their value, you are choosing your accounting policies. Indus 8 helps you understand these choices and what happens if you decide to change them or if you make a mistake. Ravi nodded, intrigued. So, what are these accounting policies? The teacher continued, accounting policies are like the rules you set for your business. They guide you on how to record your transactions. For instance, you might decide to record the cost of your inventory using the first-in first-out method, which means you sell the oldest books first. This choice reflects how you want to represent your business financially. Ravi thought about this for a moment. So, my choice of method can affect how my financial statements look? Precisely, the teacher exclaimed. Different accounting policies can lead to different financial outcomes. Therefore, Indus 8 requires you to be consistent in your policies so that your financial statements remain comparable over time. If you decide to change your accounting policy, you must disclose the reasons and effects of the change in your statements. Ravi's brow furrowed in thought. What if I realize that I need to change an estimate I made earlier? For example, if I initially estimated that a certain number of books would sell during the year, but later I find that I made a mistake. The teacher smiled, appreciating Ravi's insightful question. Ah, that's where changes in accounting estimates come into play. These changes are part of the natural course of business. Sometimes, you gather new information or realize that your previous estimates were not accurate. In your case, if you initially estimated that 200 copies of a popular book would sell but later discover that demand is lower, you may need to adjust your estimates accordingly. Ravi nodded, understanding the importance of being flexible. So, when I change an estimate, I need to reflect that in my financial statements too. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher said. 
But here's the key, changes in accounting estimates do not require retrospective adjustments. Instead, you apply the new estimate going forward. This means you update your records but do not change past statements. Ravi took a moment to absorb this information. And what about errors, sir? What happens if I make a mistake in my accounting? The teacher's expression became more serious. Good question, Ravi. Errors can happen for various reasons, whether from mathematical mistakes, oversight, or misunderstanding of facts. If you discover an error in your financial statements, Indus 8 requires you to correct it. If the error is material, meaning it significantly affects your financial position, you must restate your previous financial statements and disclose the nature of the error. Ravi's eyes widened. So, if I accidentally recorded my sales too high last year, I have to go back and fix that? The teacher nodded. Yes, and it is important to be transparent about it. By correcting errors and changing estimates when necessary, you uphold the integrity of your financial reporting. It shows your commitment to providing an accurate financial picture of your bookstore. Ravi smiled, feeling enlightened. So, Indus 8 helps me set the right rules for my accounting, make adjustments when I learn new things, and correct mistakes so that my financial story remains truthful and clear. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher beamed with pride. You've understood it perfectly. Just like a good story should be accurate and compelling, your financial statements must reflect the true state of your business. This principle of honesty is what keeps your bookstore story credible and trustworthy. As Ravi left the classroom that day, he felt empowered with knowledge about Indus 8. He realized that the world of accounting was not just about numbers, it was about telling a story that mattered, one that could guide his bookstore to a brighter future. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny afternoon, Ravi entered the classroom, excited for another engaging lesson from his beloved teacher, known for his storytelling brilliance. Today's topic was Indus 10, which focuses on events after the reporting period. Ravi could hardly contain his curiosity as he settled into his seat. The teacher began with a warm smile, Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the concept of events that occur after the reporting period, but before the financial statements are finalized. Imagine, Ravi, you are the owner of your cherished bookstore. You have just completed your financial statements for the year, but then you hear some surprising news. Let's find out how this news can affect your financial story. Ravi leaned forward, eager to learn. What kind of news, sir? The teacher continued, let's say it's the end of March, and you have just closed your accounts for the financial year. You are about to send your financial statements to the bank when you receive a call from your supplier. They inform you that a shipment of rare books, which you had been eagerly awaiting, has been delayed due to unforeseen circumstances. The shipment is now set to arrive in May. Ravi nodded, following along. How does that affect my financial statements, sir? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher replied. According to Indus 10, you need to assess whether this event provides new information about conditions that existed at the end of your reporting period. In this case, since the shipment was supposed to arrive in March, you should consider whether you should recognize any effects in your financial statements. If the delay means that you will miss a significant sales opportunity, you may need to disclose that fact, even if it doesn't change the numbers in your financial statements. Ravi thought for a moment. So, I have to decide whether to include this information or not? Precisely, the teacher said enthusiastically. There are two types of events to consider. The first are adjusting events, which provide new information about conditions that existed at the reporting date. For instance, if you found out that a customer returned a large order due to defects after the reporting period, this would be an adjusting event, and you would need to update your financial statements to reflect the return. Ravi's eyes widened with understanding. And what about the second type of event? The teacher smiled, pleased with Ravi's engagement. The second type is non-adjusting events. These are events that occur after the reporting period but do not provide new information about conditions that existed before the reporting date. For example, if a major fire breaks out in your bookstore in April, it would be a non-adjusting event. While it is significant and may impact your future operations, it does not change the financial position as of March 31st. You would disclose it in the notes of your financial statements, but you wouldn't adjust the figures. Ravi contemplated this for a moment. So, if something important happens after the reporting period, I need to determine if it affects the past or just the future? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher replied, his eyes shining with approval. Indus 10 requires you to disclose significant non-adjusting events so that users of your financial statements are aware of potential impacts on your business moving forward. Ravi raised his hand again, eager to learn more. 
What happens if I forget to mention an important event? The teacher's expression turned serious. If you fail to disclose significant events after the reporting period, it could mislead users of your financial statements. This is why it is crucial to be diligent in assessing all events that happen after the reporting date and determine whether they should be adjusted or disclosed. Transparency is key to maintaining trust with your investors and customers. Ravi smiled, feeling enlightened. So, Indus 10 helps me keep track of events that might impact my bookstore, ensuring I share all the necessary information to provide a true picture of my business. Exactly, the teacher said with pride. Remember, just like in a compelling story, the details matter. The events that happen after the reporting period can change the narrative of your business and affect the decisions of those who read your financial statements. As Ravi left the classroom that day, he felt empowered with a deeper understanding of Indus 10. He realized that accounting was not just about numbers, it was about telling a complete and honest story about his bookstore, one that could guide it through both challenges and opportunities. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a breezy afternoon, Ravi walked into the classroom, ready to dive into another captivating lesson from his renowned teacher. Today, the topic was Indus 12, which covers income taxes. Ravi was eager to learn how this important subject would unfold in the unique storytelling style of his teacher. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted the students with a warm smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the world of income taxes, which is a vital aspect of managing a business. Imagine, Ravi, that you are running your favorite bookstore, and let's see how income taxes play a role in your financial journey. Ravi leaned in, intrigued. What do you mean, sir? The teacher continued, let's say that after a year of hard work, your bookstore has earned a profit. You have sold many books, and your financial records show a healthy income. However, this also means you have to consider your tax obligations. According to Indus 12, you need to account for both the current tax you owe and any deferred tax liabilities. Ravi's curiosity was piqued. What is the current tax, sir? The teacher explained, the current tax is the amount of income tax you owe for the current year based on your taxable profit. This is determined by applying the tax rate set by the government to your taxable income. So, if your bookstore earned a profit of 1 million rupees and the tax rate is 25%, you would owe 250,000 rupees in taxes for that year. Ravi's eyes widened as he processed this information. So, I have to set aside that money for taxes. Exactly, the teacher replied enthusiastically. However, income tax accounting doesn't end there. We also have to think about deferred taxes. This concept acknowledges that sometimes, there are temporary differences between how accounting profit is calculated and how taxable profit is calculated. Ravi furrowed his brow. What do you mean by temporary differences? The teacher continued, let's say you bought new shelves for your bookstore for 500,000 rupees. For accounting purposes, you might spread this cost over five years as depreciation. But for tax purposes, the government might allow you to deduct the full cost in the year you bought them. This creates a difference between your accounting profit and taxable profit. The difference leads to what we call a deferred tax asset or liability. Ravi was beginning to understand. So, if I can deduct the full cost now, I won't pay as much tax this year, but I will have to pay more tax in the future when my deduct irons decrease? Correct, the teacher exclaimed. If you can deduct more now, it means you pay less tax now, creating a deferred tax liability for the future when the deduct irons are lower. Conversely, if you have deferred tax assets, it means you will pay less tax in the future. Ravi nodded, grasping the concept. So, it's like balancing my tax payments over time. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher replied. Indus 12 helps you to recognize these deferred taxes so that your financial statements reflect a more accurate picture of your tax obligations. It ensures that you are not only focused on the present tax but also prepared for what is to come. Ravi raised his hand with another question. What if I make a mistake in my tax calculations? The teacher's expression turned serious. That's a crucial point, Ravi. If you make errors in recognizing your income tax liabilities or deferred taxes, it can lead to significant consequences. It could affect your financial statements and mislead users about your business's financial position. Transparency and accuracy are key. Ravi smiled, feeling enlightened. So, Indus 12 helps me keep track of my tax obligations and ensures that I account for current and future tax effects accurately, right? Exactly, the teacher beamed with pride. Just like in a well-crafted story, every detail matters. By understanding income taxes, you can ensure that your bookstore remains financially healthy and compliant with regulations. 
As Ravi left the classroom that day, he felt empowered with a clearer understanding of Indus 12. He realized that managing income taxes was not just about numbers, it was about preparing his bookstore for a successful future, balancing present obligations with future responsibilities, and ensuring a trustworthy narrative in his financial story. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and sunny morning, Ravi walked into the classroom, filled with excitement for another lesson from his exceptional teacher, who was renowned for weaving engaging stories into every subject. Today's topic was Inda 16, which focused on property, plant, and equipment. Ravi was eager to see how his teacher would bring this concept to life. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted the students with enthusiasm. Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the fascinating world of property, plant, and equipment, or as we often call it, PPE. Imagine, Ravi, that you are the proud owner of your very own bookstore. Let's embark on a journey to understand how to account for the physical assets that help your business thrive. Ravi settled into his seat, intrigued. What do you mean by property, plant, and equipment, sir? The teacher smiled, sensing Ravi's curiosity. Great question, Ravi. Property, plant, and equipment are the tangible assets that you use in your business operations to generate income. These could include your bookstore building, the shelves filled with books, the computers you use for inventory management, and even the furniture where customers sit. Essentially, these are the assets that have a useful life of more than one accounting period. Ravi nodded, beginning to see the picture. So, how do I account for these assets? The teacher continued, under Inda 16, the first step is to recognize the cost of these assets at the time of acquisition. For example, if you buy a building for your bookstore, the cost includes not just the purchase price but also any related expenses, such as legal fees, taxes, and installation costs. This total amount becomes the initial value of your asset. Ravi raised his hand. And what happens after that, sir? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher replied, pleased with the engagement. Once you have recognized the cost, you need to consider how to measure the asset over its useful life. There are two primary methods, the cost model and the revaluation model. With the cost model, you continue to carry the asset at its cost less any accumulated depreciation. Depreciation is how you allocate the cost of the asset over its useful life, reflecting the wear and tear it experiences as you use it. Ravi thought for a moment. So, if I buy a shell for 50,000 rupees and it has a useful life of 10 years, I would depreciate it over that time? Exactly, the teacher replied with a smile. In this case, you would recognize a portion of that cost as an expense each year. However, if you choose the revaluation model, you can periodically adjust the carrying amount of the asset to its fair value. This means that if your building appreciates in value, you can increase its value on your balance sheet, reflecting the true worth of your asset. Ravi was fascinated. So, I have a choice on how to account for my assets based on how I want to represent their value? Correct, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. But remember, regardless of the method you choose, you must consistently apply it to similar assets to ensure comparability. This is key to transparent financial reporting. Ravi raised another question, what about repairs and improvements? How do I handle those? Great question, the teacher replied enthusiastically. If you incur costs to maintain or repair your assets, those expenses are generally charged to profit or losses incurred. However, if you make significant improvements that enhance the asset's value or extend its useful life, you can capitalize those costs, meaning you add them to the asset's carrying amount. Ravi nodded thoughtfully. So, if I upgrade my bookstore's lighting system, I need to decide whether it is a simple repair or an improvement? Exactly, the teacher affirmed. Now, let's talk about disposal. When you decide to sell or retire an asset, you need to remove it from your books. If you sell a shelf for 20,000 rupees after using it for several years, you must consider its carrying amount at the time of sale and recognize any gain or loss on the disposal. Ravi smiled, feeling enlightened. So, Inda 16 helps me understand how to account for all the physical assets that I use in my bookstore, from purchasing to measuring value and even disposing of them, right? Absolutely, the teacher beamed with pride. Just like every story has a beginning, middle, and end, your financial journey with property, plant, and equipment involves recognizing, measuring, and ultimately disposing of your assets as you navigate the world of business. As Ravi left the classroom that day, he felt empowered with a deeper understanding of Inda 16. He realized that managing property, plant, and equipment was not just about numbers, it was about strategically handling the assets that would help his bookstore flourish and grow in the future.
Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a rainy afternoon, Ravi walked into the classroom, ready to soak up another fascinating lesson from his beloved teacher, known for turning complex subjects into captivating stories. Today's topic was Indus 17, which dealt with leases, a concept that would soon be replaced by Indus 116. Ravi was eager to discover how his teacher would make this topic come alive. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted the students with enthusiasm. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the world of leases, which are vital agreements in the realm of business. Let's imagine that you, Ravi, are the proud owner of your own bookstore. This story will help us understand how leases work and why they matter. Ravi settled into his seat, curious. What is a lease, sir? The teacher smiled, sensing Ravi's eagerness to learn. A lease is essentially a contract between two parties, the lessor, who owns an asset, and the lessee, who pays to use that asset. In your case, if you decide to open your bookstore in a rented space instead of buying a building, you would be the lessee, and the landlord would be the lessor. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the concept. So, if I want to rent a space for my bookstore, I will have to sign a lease agreement? Exactly, the teacher confirmed. This agreement outlines the terms of your lease, including the duration, the rental payments, and any responsibilities you have regarding the property. Under Indus 17, you would categorize leases as either operating leases or finance leases. Ravi raised his hand, intrigued. What's the difference between the two, sir? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. An operating lease is a lease that does not transfer substantially all the risks and rewards of ownership of the asset. For example, if you rent a building for your bookstore for a few years without any option to purchase it, this would be considered an operating lease. In this case, you would simply recognize the lease payments as an expense in your income statement. Ravi was beginning to understand. And what about a finance lease? Good observation, the teacher said. A finance lease, on the other hand, transfers substantially all the risks and rewards associated with the asset to the lessee. If you were to lease a delivery vehicle for your bookstore with the option to purchase it at the end of the lease term, it would be classified as a finance lease. In this scenario, you would recognize the asset and liability on your balance sheet, reflecting the value of the leased asset and your obligation to make lease payments. Ravi's eyes widened with understanding. So, with a finance lease, I treat the leased asset like it is my own? Precisely, the teacher beamed. You would also depreciate the asset over its useful life and recognize interest expenses on the lease liability. This approach provides a more comprehensive view of your financial position. Ravi raised another question, what if my lease terms change, or if I decide to end the lease early? Excellent inquiry, Ravi, the teacher replied. Indus 17 requires you to assess the terms of your lease regularly. If there are changes, you may need to re-evaluate how you account for the lease. This includes determining whether any reassessment results in a modification of your lease liability or asset. Early termination of a lease might also result in recognizing any penalties as expenses. Ravi nodded, processing the information. So, I need to stay on top of my lease agreements and their terms. Exactly, the teacher affirmed. Understanding leases is crucial for effective financial management. It's important to recognize how these agreements impact your financial statements and overall business strategy. The teacher paused for a moment before continuing. Now, while Indus 17 provides a framework for accounting for leases, it is essential to note that it has been replaced by Indus 116, which introduces new concepts regarding lease liabilities and right of use assets. Under Indus 116, almost all leases are recorded on the balance sheet, providing a clearer picture of a company's financial obligations. Ravi's curiosity deepened. So, Indus 116 changes the way we handle leases? Indeed, Ravi, the teacher replied with enthusiasm. It focuses on the right to use an asset rather than just the lease payment. This shift helps businesses like your bookstore present a more accurate view of their financial position. As the lesson concluded, Ravi left the classroom feeling empowered with a better understanding of Indus 17 and its successor Indus 116. He realized that managing leases was not just about agreements, it was about strategically handling assets and liabilities that could significantly affect the future of his bookstore. Understanding leases would enable him to make informed decisions and navigate the world of business with confidence. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications.
On a bright, cheerful day, Ravi entered the classroom, bubbling with enthusiasm for another engaging lesson from his beloved teacher, who had a knack for turning complex concepts into captivating narratives. Today, the focus was on Indus 19, which addresses employee benefits. Ravi was excited to learn how this important topic would unfold in a story format. As the teacher stepped into the classroom, he greeted the students with a warm smile. Good morning, everyone. Today, we will delve into the world of employee benefits and understand how they impact both employees and businesses. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you are the proud owner of your bookstore, and you are considering how to reward and support your employees. This story will help us understand the nuances of employee benefits under Indus 19. Ravi settled into his seat, curious. What do you mean by employee benefits, sir? The teacher smiled, sensing Ravi's eagerness. Employee benefits are various types of compensation provided to employees in addition to their salaries. They can take many forms, such as pensions, health insurance, paid leave, and bonuses. Under Indus 19, these benefits are classified into several categories. Ravi nodded, intrigued. What are these categories, sir? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. There are mainly three categories of employee benefits under Indus 19. The first category is short-term employee benefits. These are benefits that are expected to be settled within 12 months after the end of the reporting period. For example, if you provide your employees with annual leave or bonuses that they can use or receive within the year, these would fall into this category. You would recognize the expense related to these benefits as they are earned by the employees. Ravi contemplated this. So, if I give my employees a bonus at the end of the year based on sales, I need to account for it right away? Exactly, the teacher affirmed. Now, the second category is post-employment benefits, which includes pensions and retirement plans. When you decide to offer a pension plan for your employees, you must recognize the expense associated with this benefit over their working lives. This ensures that you are setting aside sufficient funds to meet your future obligations to them when they retire. Ravi raised his hand with a question. How do I calculate those expenses, sir? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher replied. To determine the expense for post-employment benefits, you would need to consider actuarial valuations, which involve assessing various factors such as employee life expectancy and salary growth. This helps you estimate how much you need to set aside to cover these future obligations. Ravi nodded thoughtfully, processing this information. And what's the third category? The third category is other long-term employee benefits, the teacher explained. These benefits are not expected to be settled within 12 months but are also not post-employment benefits. An example would be long service leave or deferred compensation. For these benefits, you would recognize the expense as the employees render their services over the years. Ravi smiled, feeling enlightened. So, I need to account for different types of benefits based on when they are settled and how they impact my finances? Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher said with pride. Under Indus 19, it is crucial to accurately account for these employee benefits. This not only helps you in financial reporting but also strengthens your relationship with your employees. By providing competitive benefits, you can attract and retain talented staff for your bookstore. Ravi raised another question. What happens if I don't account for these benefits properly? The teacher's expression turned serious. If you fail to recognize or inaccurately calculate employee benefits, it can lead to significant implications for your financial statements. It could mislead stakeholders about the financial health of your business and may even lead to legal repercussions. Therefore, transparency and accuracy in accounting for employee benefits are essential. Ravi nodded, understanding the importance of the topic. So, Indus 19 helps me understand how to manage employee benefits effectively and ensure that I fulfill my obligations as an employer, right? Exactly, the teacher beamed. Just like in a well-told story, every detail matters. By understanding employee benefits, you can create a positive work environment, ensuring your bookstore thrives through the commitment and loyalty of your employees. As Ravi left the classroom that day, he felt empowered with a deeper understanding of Indus 19. He realized that managing employee benefits was not just about fulfilling obligations, it was about creating a supportive and rewarding environment for his team, ensuring the long-term success of his bookstore. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a warm and sunny afternoon, Ravi walked into the classroom, eager for another insightful lesson from his beloved teacher, known for transforming complex subjects into engaging stories. Today's topic was Indus 20, which focuses on accounting for government grants and disclosure of government assistance. 
Ravi was curious about how this important concept would be illustrated through storytelling. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted the students with enthusiasm. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the fascinating world of government grants and assistance. Let's imagine that you, Ravi, are the owner of a small bookstore and have recently applied for a government grant to support your business. This story will help us understand how to account for and disclose such grants. Ravi settled into his seat, ready to learn. What exactly is a government grant, sir? The teacher smiled, sensing Ravi's curiosity. A government grant is financial assistance provided by the government to support specific activities or initiatives, such as starting or expanding a business, improving infrastructure, or conducting research. These grants can come in various forms, such as cash payments, tax benefits, or loans on favorable terms. Ravi nodded, intrigued. So, if I apply for a grant to help my bookstore purchase new inventory or improve the store's layout, how would I account for that? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. Under Indus 20, the accounting treatment for government grants depends on how you intend to use the grant. There are mainly two approaches, the income approach and the deferred income approach. Let's explore these in our story. Ravi leaned in, eager to hear more. What's the income approach? The teacher continued, imagine you receive a cash grant of 100,000 rupees to purchase new inventory for your bookstore. Under the income approach, you would recognize this grant as income in the period it is received. This means that when you receive the grant, you will report it as part of your revenue in your income statement, reflecting the benefit gained from the government assistance. Ravi thought for a moment. So, I would show this grant as part of my earnings for that year? Exactly, the teacher confirmed. Now, let's discuss the deferred income approach. Suppose instead that you receive a grant to build a new section in your bookstore. Under this approach, you would not recognize the grant as income immediately. Instead, you would record it as a liability and recognize it as income over the useful life of the asset you acquired with the grant. This way, the income from the grant matches the expenses incurred in using the asset. Ravi nodded, starting to understand. So, if I receive a grant to build a new reading area, I would gradually recognize that income over the time I use that area? Precisely, the teacher exclaimed. This method ensures that your financial statements accurately reflect the ongoing benefits of the grant. Ravi raised another question. What about the disclosure of government assistance, sir? Great inquiry, Ravi, the teacher replied. Under Indus 20, you are also required to disclose information about the nature and extent of government grants received. This includes how you accounted for them, any conditions attached to the grants, and the impact on your financial position. Transparency is essential to provide stakeholders with a clear picture of your business's financial health. Ravi was beginning to see the importance of this topic. So, I need to provide detailed information about any grants I receive to ensure clarity for my customers, investors, and anyone interested in my bookstore? Exactly, the teacher affirmed. This transparency builds trust and ensures that your financial statements are reliable and informative. Ravi contemplated the significance of government grants. So, they can be a valuable resource for my bookstore, helping me to grow and improve my services? Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher said with pride. When used wisely, government grants can provide essential support for your business. However, it's crucial to account for them correctly to maintain accurate financial records and comply with regulations. As the lesson concluded, Ravi left the classroom feeling enlightened about Indus 20. He realized that understanding how to account for government grants and disclose government assistance was not just about numbers, it was about strategically utilizing resources that could help his bookstore thrive while ensuring transparency and compliance. With this knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to make informed decisions that would support the growth and success of his beloved bookstore. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and sunny day, Ravi walked into the classroom, excited for another engaging lesson from his beloved teacher, renowned for weaving captivating stories around complex subjects. Today, the focus was on Indus 21, which deals with the effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. Ravi was curious to see how his teacher would bring this topic to life through storytelling. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted the students with enthusiasm. Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the fascinating world of foreign exchange rates and how they impact businesses. Let's imagine that you, Ravi, are the owner of a small bookstore that imports books from different countries. This story will help us understand how fluctuations in foreign exchange rates affect your business operations and financial reporting. Ravi settled into his seat, eager to learn. 
What do you mean by foreign exchange rates, sir? The teacher smiled, sensing Ravi's curiosity. Foreign exchange rates refer to the value of one currency in relation to another. For instance, if you import books from the United States, you will need to convert Indian rupees into US dollars to make your purchases. The exchange rate determines how much rupees you need to pay for a dollar. These rates can fluctuate due to various factors, such as economic conditions, interest rates, and political stability. Ravi nodded, intrigued. So, how do these fluctuations affect my bookstore? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. Let's imagine that you decide to import a set of popular novels priced at 1,000 US dollars. When you make the purchase, the exchange rate is 75 rupees to 1 dollar, meaning you would need 75,000 rupees to complete the transaction. Ravi pictured the scenario. I understand, but what if the exchange rate changes after I place my order? Exactly, the teacher continued. Now, let's say that by the time your shipment arrives, the exchange rate has changed to 80 rupees to 1 dollar. You would now need 80,000 rupees to pay for the same set of novels. This increase means that your cost of purchasing these books has gone up, affecting your profit margins. Ravi contemplated this. So, the fluctuating exchange rates can increase my costs unexpectedly? Precisely, the teacher affirmed. Under Indus 21, businesses must account for these foreign currency transactions in their financial statements. When you record your transactions, you would initially recognize them at the exchange rate on the transaction date. However, at the end of each reporting period, you need to re-evaluate these foreign currency monetary items, such as cash, receivables, and payables, using the current exchange rates. Ravi raised his hand with a question. What happens if the exchange rate changes in my favor? Excellent inquiry, Ravi, the teacher replied. If the exchange rate improves and becomes more favorable, it could decrease your costs. For instance, if the exchange rate drops to 70 rupees to 1 dollar, you would only need 70,000 rupees to purchase the same set of novels. In this case, you could recognize a foreign exchange gain, which would positively impact your financial results. Ravi nodded, beginning to see the importance of monitoring exchange rates. So, I need to be aware of these rates not just when I make a purchase but also regularly after that? Exactly, the teacher said with pride. This awareness allows you to manage your foreign currency risks more effectively. Additionally, when you prepare your financial statements, you must disclose any foreign exchange gains or losses, providing a clearer picture of how currency fluctuations impact your business. Ravi was fascinated by the topic. So, if I have transactions in multiple currencies, I need to track all of them. Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. Each foreign currency transaction needs to be accounted for separately, and you must recognize any adjustments in your profit or loss statements based on exchange rate fluctuations. As the lesson continued, the teacher emphasized the significance of understanding the effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. By effectively managing these risks, you can protect your bookstore's profitability and ensure that you are prepared for any potential challenges arising from currency fluctuations. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the room feeling empowered with newfound knowledge about Indus 21. He realized that understanding the effects of changes in foreign exchange rates was not merely about accounting, it was about making informed decisions that could safeguard the financial health of his bookstore. With this knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to navigate the complexities of international trade, ensuring that his business thrived in an ever-changing global landscape. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a cool and breezy afternoon, Ravi eagerly entered the classroom, anticipating yet another enlightening lesson from his favorite teacher, who was known for transforming even the driest topics into fascinating stories. Today, the topic was Indus 23, which deals with borrowing costs. Ravi was curious to see how his teacher would unravel this concept through one of his signature narratives. As the teacher entered, he smiled warmly and greeted his students. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to dive into the world of borrowing costs. Imagine, Ravi, that you've taken a loan to build a new section in your bookstore, maybe a cozy reading area with comfortable chairs and shelves full of the latest books. This story will help us understand how to account for the costs associated with borrowing money. Ravi, as usual, settled in with curiosity. What do you mean by borrowing costs, sir? The teacher's face lit up as he began his explanation. Borrowing costs refer to the interest and other costs you incur when you take out a loan to finance an asset, such as your bookstore expansion. These costs could include interest on the loan, any fees paid to lenders, and sometimes even exchange rate differences on borrowings if you've taken a loan in a foreign currency. Ravi nodded, intrigued. 
So, if I take out a loan to expand my bookstore, the interest I pay on that loan would be a borrowing cost. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher replied with a smile, but there's more to it. Under Indus 23, the key question is whether the borrowing cost should be expensed immediately or capitalized, that is, added to the cost of the asset you are building. This depends on the type of asset you are financing. Ravi leaned forward, eager to understand. What do you mean by capitalizing borrowing costs? Great question, the teacher exclaimed. Let's say you took a loan of 10 lakh rupees to build that new reading section in your bookstore. The construction will take some time, maybe six months. During this period, you're paying interest on the loan. Instead of recognizing that interest as an expense right away, you can capitalize it, meaning you add the interest cost to the total cost of the new section. Ravi raised his hand. So, the interest I'm paying during the construction period becomes part of the cost of the asset? Exactly, the teacher affirmed. Under Indus 23, if you borrow money to finance the construction of a qualifying asset, like your bookstore's new section, the interest costs you incur during the construction period are added to the cost of the asset. This means you recognize the borrowing costs as part of the asset's value, not as an immediate expense. Ravi thought for a moment. What's a qualifying asset, sir? Good question again, Ravi, the teacher responded. A qualifying asset is one that takes a substantial period of time to get ready for its intended use. In your case, the new reading section would be a qualifying asset because it takes months to construct. On the other hand, if you took a loan just to purchase more books or smaller equipment, those would not be qualifying assets since they can be used immediately. In that case, the borrowing costs would be expensed right away. Ravi nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. So, if I'm constructing something that takes time, I capitalize the borrowing costs. But if it's for something ready to use right away, I expense the borrowing costs. Precisely, the teacher said with pride. Now, there's one more important point. Once the construction is completed, you stop capitalizing the borrowing costs. From that point onward, any further interest payments on the loan will be treated as an expense in your profit and loss statement. Ravi raised another question. What happens if the construction is delayed? Do I still capitalize the borrowing costs? The teacher smiled at Ravi's attention to detail. Excellent question. If the construction is delayed due to reasons beyond your control, such as bad weather or regulatory approvals, you continue to capitalize the borrowing costs. However, if the delay is within your control, such as poor project management, then you stop capitalizing during that period. Ravi was fascinated by how such a seemingly straightforward topic could have so many layers. So, Indus 23 helps me understand how to account for the costs of borrowing based on the nature of what I'm financing and the timing of when the asset is ready for use. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher said, beaming. By capitalizing borrowing costs when appropriate, you ensure that your financial statements accurately reflect the true cost of your assets. This is important because it gives a clearer picture to anyone reading your financial reports, whether it's investors, creditors, or other stakeholders. As the lesson drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom feeling empowered with a deeper understanding of Indus 23. He realized that accounting for borrowing costs wasn't just about managing interest payments, it was about ensuring that his financial statements told the complete story of his bookstore's growth. With this knowledge, Ravi felt ready to make informed decisions that would help his business expand in a financially sound manner. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and cheerful morning, Ravi entered the classroom, eager to absorb the day's lesson from his favorite teacher, renowned for transforming complex subjects into captivating stories. Today's topic was Indus 24, which focuses on related party disclosures. Ravi was curious to see how his teacher would illustrate this concept through storytelling. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted the students with a warm smile. Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the world of related party transactions and the importance of transparency in financial reporting. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you are the owner of a popular bookstore, and you are considering doing business with a family member. This story will help us understand the significance of related party disclosures. Ravi settled into his seat, intrigued. What do you mean by related party transactions, sir? The teacher began, related party transactions occur when two parties are connected in a way that can influence their business dealings. This could be through family ties, ownership interests, or control. For instance, if you decide to purchase books from a publishing company owned by your uncle, that transaction would be considered a related party transaction. Ravi nodded, beginning to understand. So, it's about transactions that involve parties who have a special relationship? Exactly, the teacher confirmed. 
Under INDAS 24, businesses must disclose these related party transactions to ensure transparency. This is important because related parties may not operate on the same terms as unrelated parties. For instance, you might get a better deal from your uncle than you would from a different publisher, which could affect the fairness of your financial statements. Ravi thought for a moment. What kind of disclosures do I need to make if I have related party transactions? The teacher continued, you need to disclose the nature of the relationship with the related party, the transactions that occurred, and the amounts involved. It's essential to provide enough information so that users of the financial statements can understand how these transactions might impact your business. Ravi raised his hand, eager to learn more. Can you give me an example, sir? Certainly, Ravi, the teacher replied, pleased with his enthusiasm. Let's say you sold 10,000 rupees worth of books to your uncle's publishing company and then received 5,000 rupees in return for promotional support in your bookstore. In your financial statements, you would disclose the nature of your relationship with your uncle, the transactions that took place, and their monetary value. This way, anyone looking at your financial reports will see that you had transactions with a related party and can assess whether these transactions were conducted fairly. Ravi was starting to see the importance of these disclosures. So, it's not just about reporting the numbers, it's about ensuring that everything is transparent and understood. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher said with pride. Transparency is key to building trust with stakeholders, including investors, creditors, and customers. If they are aware of related party transactions, they can make informed decisions about your business. Ravi contemplated the potential implications. What if I don't disclose these transactions? What happens then? The teacher's expression turned serious. If you fail to disclose related party transactions, it can lead to serious consequences. It might create the impression that your financial statements are misleading, which can damage your reputation and erode trust with stakeholders. Regulatory authorities also take this matter seriously, and failing to comply with disclosure requirements can result in penalties. Ravi nodded, realizing the importance of this concept. So, related party disclosures are not just a formality, they are crucial for the integrity of financial reporting. Absolutely, the teacher affirmed. By ensuring that all related party transactions are properly disclosed, you protect your business's reputation and promote accountability in your financial reporting. As the lesson drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom feeling enlightened about Indus 24. He understood that related party transactions could have a significant impact on his bookstore's financial statements and that transparency was vital to maintaining trust and credibility. With this knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to manage his business ethically and responsibly, ensuring that he always put integrity first in his financial dealings. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and sunny afternoon, Ravi walked into his classroom, eager to learn from his favorite teacher, who was well known for his ability to weave captivating narratives around complex subjects. Today's lesson focused on Indus 27, which deals with separate financial statements. Ravi was curious to see how his teacher would bring this topic to life through storytelling. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted his students with enthusiasm. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to delve into the world of separate financial statements. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you own a successful bookstore and, over time, you decide to start a small publishing house as a subsidiary. This story will help us understand the importance and the principles behind separate financial statements. Ravi settled into his seat, intrigued by the scenario. So, what do you mean by separate financial statements, sir? The teacher smiled and began, separate financial statements are the financial reports prepared by an entity, such as your bookstore, that operates independently of its subsidiaries or other entities. In our case, although you have a bookstore and a publishing house, the financial statements for each will be prepared separately. This allows you to see the performance and financial position of each business independently. Ravi nodded, trying to grasp the concept. So, if I prepare separate financial statements for my bookstore and my publishing house, I can evaluate how each one is doing without mixing their finances? Exactly, the teacher confirmed. By preparing separate financial statements, you can assess the profitability, assets, and liabilities of each entity. This is especially important for decision-making and understanding the financial health of each business. For instance, if your bookstore is thriving but your publishing house is struggling, you can identify the need for adjustments without the financial results of one affecting the other. Ravi raised his hand, eager for further clarification. What specific information should I include in my separate financial statements, sir? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. 
In separate financial statements, you should include your assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expenses for each entity. You would recognize your investments in subsidiaries at cost, and any dividends received from the subsidiary would be recognized in your income statement. This gives a clear picture of the financial position of your bookstore and your publishing house separately. Ravi thought for a moment and asked, what about consolidation? I often hear about consolidated financial statements when talking about businesses with subsidiaries. The teacher nodded, pleased with Ravi's curiosity. You're right, consolidated financial statements combine the financial results of the parent company and its subsidiaries into one comprehensive report. However, separate financial statements focus on the individual performance of each entity. This is particularly useful for stakeholders who want to understand the specific contributions of each part of your business. Ravi pondered the implications of this approach. So, separate financial statements are essential for clarity and transparency? Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. They provide stakeholders with vital information about each entity's performance and help ensure that the financial reporting is clear and understandable. This is crucial for making informed decisions, whether you're looking to attract investors, secure loans, or analyze your business strategy. As the lesson progressed, the teacher emphasized the significance of adhering to Indus 27. By preparing separate financial statements, you promote accountability and transparency, allowing your stakeholders to make informed decisions based on accurate financial information. As the class came to a close, Ravi left feeling enlightened about Indus 27. He understood that preparing separate financial statements for his bookstore and publishing house would allow him to evaluate each business's financial health independently. With this knowledge, Ravi felt empowered to manage his enterprises effectively, ensuring that he could navigate the complexities of running multiple businesses while maintaining transparency and clarity in his financial reporting. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a rainy afternoon, as droplets danced on the classroom windows, Ravi stepped into the familiar space filled with anticipation for another engaging lesson from his favorite teacher, who had a gift for turning complex topics into compelling narratives. Today's lesson revolved around Indus 28, which addresses investments in associates and joint ventures. Ravi was eager to see how his teacher would unfold this subject through storytelling. As the teacher entered, he greeted his students with a warm smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the concept of investments in associates and joint ventures. Let's imagine that you, Ravi, have successfully established your bookstore, and now you are considering a partnership with another local business to open a coffee corner within your store. This partnership will serve as an excellent illustration of today's topic. Ravi's eyes lit up at the thought. So, what do you mean by associates and joint ventures, sir? The teacher began, an associate is a company in which another company has significant influence, typically represented by ownership of 20 to 50 percent of the voting power. In contrast, a joint venture is a partnership where two or more parties come together to undertake a specific project, sharing control over that project. In our case, your bookstore and the coffee shop would be a joint venture. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. How would I account for my investment in the coffee corner? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. When you invest in an associate or a joint venture, you account for it using the equity method. This means you initially recognize the investment at cost. Afterward, you adjust the carrying amount of the investment to reflect your share of the profit or loss of the associate or joint venture. For instance, if the coffee corner earns a profit, you would increase the value of your investment in your financial statements. Ravi nodded, trying to grasp the concept. So, if the coffee corner makes a profit of 1 lakh rupees, and I own 50% of it, I would recognize an additional 50,000 rupees in my books. Exactly, the teacher confirmed with enthusiasm. Conversely, if the coffee corner incurs a loss, you would reduce the carrying amount of your investment accordingly. This method reflects the performance of the associate or joint venture in your financial statements, giving a more accurate picture of your investment's value. Ravi raised his hand, eager for further clarification. What about dividends? How would that work? Another excellent question, the teacher replied. If the coffee corner distributes dividends, you would recognize those dividends as income in your financial statements. However, you would not adjust the carrying amount of your investment for the dividends received, as they are distributions of profits that have already been accounted for. Ravi thought about the implications of such a partnership. So, by using the equity method, I am able to showcase the performance of my investment in the coffee corner without fully consolidating it into my financial statements? Precisely, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. 
This approach allows you to reflect your share of the associate's or joint venture's profits or losses, keeping your financial statements clear and meaningful. It's especially useful when the associate or joint venture operates independently but is still significant to your overall financial health. As the lesson progressed, the teacher highlighted the importance of disclosing relevant information about associates and joint ventures. You must disclose details about the nature of your relationship with the associate or joint venture, the carrying amount of the investment, and your share of profits or losses. This transparency helps stakeholders understand the impact of these investments on your financial position. Ravi felt a sense of clarity wash over him. So, Indus 28 not only guides me on how to account for these investments but also emphasizes the importance of transparency in reporting. Exactly, the teacher said with pride, by following the principles of Indus 28, you ensure that your financial statements present a fair view of your investments, allowing stakeholders to make informed decisions. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom inspired by the concept of investments in associates and joint ventures. He realized that entering into partnerships could not only enhance his bookstore but also offer valuable insights into financial reporting. With this knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to explore new business opportunities while maintaining transparency and accuracy in his financial dealings. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bustling afternoon, Ravi walked into his classroom, brimming with excitement for another captivating lesson from his favorite teacher, known for transforming complex subjects into engaging stories. Today's topic was Indus 29, which deals with financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies. Ravi was curious to see how his teacher would weave this intricate subject into a relatable narrative. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted his students with a bright smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the intriguing concept of hyperinflation and how it affects financial reporting. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you live in a fictional country called Inflatia, where prices are rising rapidly and the currency is losing value at an astonishing rate. This scenario will help us understand the principles of Indus 29. Ravi leaned in, intrigued. What does hyperinflation mean, sir? The teacher began, hyperinflation occurs when the inflation rate exceeds a specific threshold, often considered to be around 100% or more over three years. In such a situation, the purchasing power of money erodes quickly, making financial transactions and reporting extremely challenging. In Inflatia, you might notice that the cost of a loaf of bread doubles every few weeks. Ravi's eyes widened at the thought, that sounds chaotic. How does this affect financial reporting? Excellent question, the teacher replied. When an economy experiences hyperinflation, traditional financial reporting methods become inadequate. Under Indus 29, entities operating in hyperinflationary economies must adjust their financial statements to reflect the changing value of money. This ensures that the financial statements remain relevant and reliable. Ravi's curiosity deepened. How do we adjust these financial statements, sir? The teacher continued, first, you need to identify the general price index and the current rate of inflation. Then, financial statements should be restated in terms of the purchasing power of the currency at the reporting date. This involves converting historical costs into current amounts using the price index. Ravi considered this for a moment. So, if I bought an asset for 1 lakh rupees last year, and the price index has increased significantly since then, I would need to adjust that asset's value in my financial statements. Exactly, the teacher confirmed. Let's say the price index has increased by 50% since your purchase. You would adjust the value of the asset to 1 lakh 50,000 rupees in your financial statements. This adjustment ensures that your financial statements reflect the true economic situation in a hyperinflationary environment. Ravi raised his hand, eager to understand further. What about income and expenses? How do they get affected? Great question, the teacher replied enthusiastically. Income and expenses also need to be adjusted. For example, if you earned 50,000 rupees last year, that amount would need to be adjusted to reflect its purchasing power today. This adjustment ensures that users of the financial statements can understand the real economic impact of transactions over time. Ravi thought about the implications of this approach. So, by restating financial statements in hyperinflationary economies, I can provide a clearer picture of my business's performance and financial position? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. This practice helps stakeholders, such as investors and creditors, make informed decisions by presenting the financial information in a manner that reflects the current economic realities. As the lesson progressed, the teacher highlighted the importance of disclosing information about the adjustments made to financial statements. 
you must provide disclosures regarding the price index used and the extent of inflation during the reporting period. This transparency is crucial for stakeholders to understand the basis of your financial reporting. Ravi felt a sense of clarity and responsibility wash over him. So, Indus 29 not only guides how to report financials in hyperinflationary economies but also emphasizes the need for transparency and relevance in financial reporting. Precisely, the teacher said with pride, by adhering to the principles of Indus 29, you ensure that your financial statements provide a true reflection of your business's performance, even in challenging economic conditions. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom feeling enlightened about financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies. He understood that while the economic landscape might be unpredictable, having the right principles in place could guide him in making informed financial decisions. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to navigate the complexities of financial reporting, regardless of the economic climate. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright afternoon, as sunlight streamed through the classroom windows, Ravi entered with a sense of eagerness for another engaging lesson from his favorite teacher, renowned for his ability to weave complex financial topics into captivating stories. Today's lesson was about Indus 32, which focuses on the presentation of financial instruments. Ravi was excited to see how his teacher would unfold this subject through storytelling. As the teacher settled into the classroom, he greeted his students with a welcoming smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the fascinating world of financial instruments and how we present them in our financial statements. Let's imagine that you, Ravi, have decided to invest in various financial instruments to grow your bookstore's capital. This story will illustrate the principles of Indus 32. Ravi leaned in, intrigued. What do you mean by financial instruments, sir? The teacher began, financial instruments are contracts that create a financial asset for one entity and a financial liability or equity instrument for another. In your case, if you decide to issue bonds to raise money for your bookstore or invest in shares of a company, these activities involve financial instruments. Ravi nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. So, bonds and shares are examples of financial instruments? Precisely, the teacher affirmed. Under Indus 32, we need to classify financial instruments as either financial assets, financial liabilities, or equity instruments based on their characteristics. Understanding this classification is crucial for presenting them accurately in your financial statements. Ravi raised his hand, eager for clarification. What's the difference between these categories? The teacher explained, a financial asset is any asset that is cash or can be converted into cash, such as accounts receivable or investments in stocks. Financial liabilities, on the other hand, are obligations that require you to deliver cash or another financial asset to another entity, like loans or bonds you have issued. Equity instruments represent ownership in a company, such as shares. The classification helps determine how these instruments are reported in your financial statements. Ravi thought about this for a moment. So, if I issue bonds to raise money for my bookstore, that would be a financial liability for me? Exactly, the teacher confirmed you have an obligation to pay back the bondholders. In contrast, if you invest in shares of another company, that would be a financial asset for you, as it represents your claim to future cash flows from that investment. Ravi raised his hand again, curiosity evident on his face. What about the presentation of these instruments in my financial statements? How do I show them? The teacher smiled, pleased with Ravi's enthusiasm. Under Indus 32, you must present financial instruments in a way that clearly distinguishes between liabilities and equity. You should disclose the nature and extent of financial instruments, including their risks and how they are managed. For instance, when presenting your bonds as liabilities, you would also mention the interest rates, payment terms, and any other relevant information that helps users understand the financial position of your bookstore. Ravi considered this carefully. So, proper presentation allows stakeholders to see not just the numbers but also the context of my financial instruments? Absolutely, the teacher affirmed. By clearly presenting financial instruments, you enable stakeholders, like investors, creditors, and even your business partners, to make informed decisions based on a complete understanding of your financial situation. As the lesson progressed, the teacher highlighted the significance of proper disclosure. You should also provide information about any changes in the classification of financial instruments, their fair value, and the risks associated with them. This transparency builds trust and ensures that your financial statements remain relevant and understandable. Ravi felt a sense of clarity and responsibility wash over him. 
So, Indus 32 not only guides how to classify and present financial instruments but also emphasizes the importance of transparency and relevance in financial reporting. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher said with pride, by adhering to the principles of Indus 32, you can ensure that your financial statements accurately reflect the financial position of your bookstore, making it easier for stakeholders to navigate the complexities of your business. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom feeling enlightened about the presentation of financial instruments. He understood that the way he classified and disclosed financial instruments could significantly impact how his bookstore was perceived by others. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to manage his financial dealings effectively and transparently, ensuring that he communicated the true financial health of his business. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny afternoon, as golden rays of sunlight filtered through the classroom windows, Ravi stepped in, eager for another captivating lesson from his favorite teacher, known for transforming intricate topics into engaging narratives. Today's subject was Indus 33, which addresses earnings per share, a concept essential for understanding a company's profitability on a per share basis. Ravi was excited to see how his teacher would unfold this important topic. As the teacher entered, he greeted the students with a warm smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will delve into the concept of earnings per share, often abbreviated as EPS. Let's imagine, Ravi, that your bookstore has just launched a new line of stationary products. This exciting venture will help us understand the principles of Indus 33. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. What exactly does earnings per share mean, sir? The teacher began, earnings per share is a financial metric that indicates how much profit a company generates for each outstanding share of its common stock. This metric is vital for investors, as it helps them assess a company's profitability and make informed investment decisions. In your case, when your bookstore earns profit from selling stationery, EPS will show how much of that profit is attributable to each share of your bookstore. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the concept. So, if I have a hundred shares and my bookstore earns a profit of one lakh rupees, how would I calculate my EPS? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. To calculate EPS, you would divide the net profit by the weighted average number of shares outstanding during the period. So, if your bookstore's net profit is one lakh rupees and you have a hundred shares, your EPS would be one thousand rupees. Ravi thought about this for a moment. What if I issue more shares during the year? How would that affect my calculation? Excellent point, the teacher responded. When new shares are issued, you must calculate the weighted average number of shares outstanding. This means considering the number of shares you had at the beginning of the period, any shares issued during the period, and any shares bought back. This calculation ensures that the EPS reflects the true performance of the bookstore. Ravi raised his hand again, eager to understand further. What about different types of shares? Do they affect EPS? The teacher smiled and nodded. Yes, they do. Indus 33 distinguishes between basic EPS and diluted EPS. Basic EPS is calculated using only the common shares outstanding, while diluted EPS considers all potential shares that could be issued, such as convertible securities or stock options. This provides a more conservative view of earnings per share by reflecting the potential dilution of earnings if all convertible instruments were exercised. Ravi considered this carefully. So, if I had options that could convert into additional shares, I would need to calculate both basic and diluted EPS. Exactly, the teacher confirmed. This distinction is crucial for stakeholders to understand the potential impact of dilution on their ownership and the company's profitability. As the lesson progressed, the teacher highlighted the importance of transparency in reporting EPS. You must disclose both basic and diluted EPS on the face of your income statement, along with a reconciliation of the number of shares used in the calculations. This transparency allows investors to assess the true value of their investments. Ravi felt a sense of clarity wash over him. So, Indus 33 not only provides a method for calculating EPS but also emphasizes the importance of clear disclosures for investors. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher said with pride. By adhering to the principles of Indus 33, you ensure that your financial statements present a fair view of your bookstore's profitability, helping stakeholders make informed decisions based on accurate information. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom feeling enlightened about earnings per share. He understood that this metric was not just a number but a reflection of his bookstore's financial health and profitability. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to communicate effectively with potential investors, ensuring they understood the value of their investment in his bookstore. 
Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a breezy afternoon, with the sound of chirping birds in the background, Ravi walked into his classroom, eager for another inspiring lesson from his favorite teacher, known for his ability to turn complex financial concepts into delightful stories. Today, the topic was Indus 34, which deals with interim financial reporting. Ravi was curious to see how his teacher would bring this concept to life through storytelling. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted his students with a bright smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the world of interim financial reporting and why it is essential for businesses like yours. Let's imagine, Ravi, that your bookstore is preparing for its first quarterly report. This scenario will help us understand the principles of Indus 34. Ravi settled into his seat, intrigued. What exactly is interim financial reporting, sir? The teacher began, interim financial reporting refers to the financial statements prepared for a period shorter than a full financial year, often covering quarterly or half-yearly results. Businesses prepare these interim reports to provide stakeholders with timely and relevant information about their financial performance and position. In your case, your bookstore would prepare an interim report at the end of each quarter to inform investors, creditors, and other stakeholders about your business's progress. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the concept. So, interim reports are like snapshots of how my bookstore is doing throughout the year. Exactly, the teacher affirmed. Interim reports allow stakeholders to assess your bookstore's performance on a more frequent basis, rather than waiting for the annual report. This timely information can be crucial for making informed decisions, such as investing in your bookstore or extending credit. Ravi raised his hand, eager to understand further. What should I include in my interim financial report? The teacher smiled and responded, under Indus 34, your interim financial report should include a condensed balance sheet, a condensed income statement, a cash flow statement, and notes explaining significant changes in your financial position since the last annual report. You should also include comparative information from the previous interim period, allowing stakeholders to see trends and changes over time. Ravi considered this for a moment. So, it's not just about showing the numbers, I also need to provide context and explanations. Exactly, the teacher confirmed. Providing context helps stakeholders understand any fluctuations in your financial performance. For example, if your bookstore's sales surge during the holiday season, you should explain that in your report. This context helps to clarify the financial data and provides a more comprehensive picture of your business's health. Ravi raised his hand again, curiosity evident on his face. What about accounting policies? Do I need to follow the same ones for interim reports as I do for annual reports? The teacher nodded thoughtfully. Yes, you do. Under Indus 34, you should apply the same accounting policies in your interim reports that you use in your annual financial statements. However, you may need to provide more detail about any significant changes in accounting policies or estimates during the interim period. Transparency is key. Ravi felt a sense of responsibility wash over him. So, interim reports must be accurate, transparent, and consistent with my annual reports. Precisely, Ravi, the teacher said with pride, by adhering to the principles of Indus 34, you ensure that your interim financial reports provide a true reflection of your bookstore's performance, enabling stakeholders to make informed decisions based on reliable information. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom feeling enlightened about interim financial reporting. He understood that these reports were vital tools for communicating the financial health of his bookstore throughout the year. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to prepare his interim reports effectively, ensuring that he provided stakeholders with timely and relevant information about his bookstore's progress. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a rainy afternoon, with the rhythmic sound of raindrops tapping against the classroom windows, Ravi walked into the familiar space, eager for another enlightening lesson from his favorite teacher, known for his captivating storytelling abilities. Today's topic was Indus 36, which deals with the impairment of assets. Ravi was excited to see how his teacher would explain this important concept through a story. As the teacher settled into his chair, he greeted his students with a warm smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will dive into the concept of asset impairment. Let's imagine, Ravi, that your bookstore has been in operation for a few years, and you've invested in various assets, such as shelves, computers, and inventory. This scenario will help us understand it as 36. Ravi leaned in, curious about how this would unfold. What do you mean by impairment of assets, sir? 
the teacher began, impairment of assets occurs when the carrying amount of an asset exceeds its recoverable amount, meaning it can no longer generate enough future cash flows to justify its value on the balance sheet. In simpler terms, if an asset is not bringing in the expected returns or if its value has decreased significantly, it may be impaired. Ravi nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. So, if my bookstore sales drop significantly due to a new competitor opening nearby, how would that affect my assets? Great observation, the teacher affirmed. If your bookstore faces a decline in sales and, as a result, you realize that your inventory or the value of your shelves is no longer recoverable, you would need to assess whether these assets are impaired. You would compare their carrying amounts to their recoverable amounts. Ravi raised his hand, eager for clarification. How do I determine the recoverable amount of an asset? The teacher explained, the recoverable amount is the higher of an asset's fair value less cost to sell and its value in use. Fair value is the price you could sell the asset for in the market, while value in use refers to the present value of future cash flows expected to be derived from the asset. You need to perform this assessment regularly, especially when there are indications that an asset may be impaired. Ravi thought about this for a moment. What happens if I find out that one of my assets is impaired? If you determine that an asset is indeed impaired, the teacher continued, you must recognize an impairment loss in your financial statements. This loss is calculated as the difference between the carrying amount and the recoverable amount. By doing this, you ensure that your financial statements reflect a true and fair view of your bookstore's financial position. Ravi raised his hand again, curiosity evident on his face. What about reversals? Can I recover an impairment loss if the asset's value increases in the future? The teacher smiled, pleased with Ravi's question. Yes, indeed. Indus 36 allows for the reversal of impairment losses if the reasons for the impairment no longer exist. If your bookstore's sales improve and the recoverable amount of the asset increases, you can reverse the impairment loss to the extent that it does not exceed the carrying amount that would have been determined had no impairment loss been recognized. This ensures that your financial statements remain accurate and reflect the true value of your assets. Ravi considered this carefully. So, assessing impairment is an ongoing process, and I need to stay vigilant about my assets' values? Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. Regular assessments help you make informed decisions about your business and ensure that your financial statements provide a true representation of your bookstore's health. Indus 36 encourages businesses to maintain transparency and accountability by accurately reporting asset values. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom feeling enlightened about the impairment of assets. He understood that regularly assessing his assets for impairment was crucial for accurately reflecting the financial health of his bookstore. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt empowered to monitor his assets diligently, ensuring that he made informed decisions that would benefit his business in the long run. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a crisp autumn afternoon, with leaves gently falling outside the classroom window, Ravi entered, filled with excitement for another lesson from his renowned teacher, famous for weaving complex concepts into captivating tales. Today's topic was Indus 37, which covers provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. Ravi was eager to discover how his teacher would bring this concept to life. As the teacher walked in, he greeted the students with his signature warm smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the fascinating world of provisions and contingencies. Let's imagine, Ravi, that your bookstore has recently encountered some unexpected challenges. This scenario will help us understand Indus 37. Ravi settled in, curious about the connection. What do you mean by provisions and contingencies, sir? The teacher began, in financial reporting, a provision is an amount that you set aside in your accounts for a future obligation or expense that is probable but uncertain in timing or amount. For instance, let's say you expect to face some legal costs due to a dispute with a supplier. You would recognize a provision for that expense, even though the exact amount and timing of the payment are not yet known. Ravi nodded, starting to understand. So, a provision is like a safety net for future expenses? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. By recognizing provisions, you ensure that your financial statements reflect a more accurate picture of your bookstore's financial position. This practice helps you prepare for potential liabilities without waiting for the actual expenses to arise. Ravi raised his hand again, intrigued. What about contingent liabilities? How do they differ from provisions? The teacher smiled, pleased with Ravi's curiosity. Great question. A contingent liability is a potential obligation that may arise based on the outcome of a future event. 
For example, if you are currently being sued by a customer but have not yet settled the case or determined the outcome, you would disclose the existence of this contingent liability in your financial statements. However, you would not recognize it as a provision unless it becomes probable that you will have to make a payment. Ravi thought for a moment. So, contingent liabilities are not recognized in the financial statements but need to be disclosed if they are significant? Precisely, the teacher replied. This disclosure ensures that stakeholders are aware of potential risks that could impact your bookstore's future financial performance. Transparency is key in financial reporting. Ravi raised his hand once more, eager to learn more. What about contingent assets? Are they similar to contingent liabilities? The teacher nodded. Yes, they are related concepts but reflect potential benefits instead. A contingent asset is a possible asset that arises from a past event and will be confirmed only by the occurrence of one or more uncertain future events. For instance, if you have a claim for damages against a former employee and you expect to win, you would disclose this contingent asset in your financial statements. However, like contingent liabilities, you would not recognize it until it becomes virtually certain. Ravi contemplated this information. So, provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets all help manage uncertainties in financial reporting? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher said with enthusiasm. By following Indus 37, you not only comply with regulatory requirements but also foster trust among your stakeholders by providing them with relevant information about potential future obligations and assets. This level of transparency helps everyone make informed decisions. As the class came to a close, Ravi left feeling enlightened about provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. He understood the importance of preparing for uncertainties in his bookstore's financial management. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt empowered to apply these concepts effectively, ensuring that he maintained a clear and transparent financial picture for himself and his stakeholders. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny afternoon, with sunlight streaming through the classroom windows, Ravi eagerly entered, looking forward to yet another engaging lesson from his beloved teacher, renowned for transforming complex topics into captivating stories. Today, the subject was Indus 38, which covers intangible assets. Ravi was curious to see how his teacher would explain this intricate concept. As the teacher entered, he greeted his students with enthusiasm. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will delve into the fascinating world of intangible assets. Let's imagine, Ravi, that your bookstore is not just a place to sell books but also a hub of creativity, ideas, and innovation. This scenario will help us understand Indus 38. Ravi settled into his seat, intrigued. What exactly are intangible assets, sir? The teacher began, intangible assets are non-monetary assets that lack physical substance but provide value to your business. They can include things like trademarks, patents, copyrights, and goodwill. For instance, imagine you have created a unique logo for your bookstore that customers love and recognize. That logo is an intangible asset because it has value, even though it cannot be touched. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the idea. So, intangible assets are important for my business, even if they are not physical items? Absolutely, the teacher affirmed. Intangible assets can significantly contribute to your bookstore's competitive advantage. For example, if you own a popular brand name or have developed a successful marketing strategy, these elements can attract customers and generate revenue. However, Indus 38 outlines how to recognize, measure, and disclose these assets. Ravi raised his hand, eager for more details. How do I recognize an intangible asset in my financial statements? The teacher explained, to recognize an intangible asset, it must meet certain criteria. First, it should be identifiable, meaning it can be separated from your business or arise from contractual rights. Second, it must be controlled by your bookstore. And third, it should provide future economic benefits. If you create a new software application for managing your inventory, for instance, and it meets these criteria, you can recognize it as an intangible asset. Ravi thought about this for a moment. What about measuring the value of intangible assets? How do I determine their worth? The teacher responded, intangible assets can be measured in two ways, cost model and revaluation model. Under the cost model, you recognize the asset at its cost less any accumulated amortization and impairment losses. For example, if you spent money to develop a new branding strategy, the cost becomes the basis for valuing the intangible asset. Under the revaluation model, you can measure the asset at its fair value if an active market exists for that asset, but this is less common for intangible assets. 
Ravi raised his hand again, curiosity shining in his eyes. What about amortization? Do intangible assets get amortized like tangible assets? The teacher nodded. Yes, they do. Intangible assets with finite useful lives, such as software, are amortized over their expected useful lives. This process spreads the cost of the asset over the period it is expected to generate economic benefits. On the other hand, intangible assets with indefinite useful lives, like goodwill, are not amortized but are tested for impairment annually. Ravi considered this carefully. So, managing intangible assets is just as important as managing physical assets, and I need to keep track of their value and amortization? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher replied. By recognizing and properly managing your intangible assets, you not only comply with int as 38 but also ensure that your bookstore's financial statements accurately reflect its true value. This transparency helps investors and stakeholders understand the worth of your business beyond its tangible assets. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left the room feeling enlightened about intangible assets. He understood their significance in adding value to his bookstore and the importance of recognizing, measuring, and disclosing them accurately. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt empowered to leverage intangible assets effectively, ensuring that his bookstore could thrive in a competitive market. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and breezy afternoon, as the sun cast playful shadows through the classroom windows, Ravi entered with a sense of anticipation. He loved the way his teacher transformed complex concepts into engaging stories. Today's lesson focused on Indus 40, which deals with investment property. Ravi was eager to see how his teacher would illuminate this topic. As the teacher took his place at the front of the class, he welcomed the students with his characteristic smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the intriguing world of investment properties. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you have decided to invest in some properties for your bookstore to enhance your business portfolio. This scenario will help us understand Indus 40. Ravi leaned in, intrigued. What is investment property, sir? The teacher began, investment property is defined as property held to earn rentals or for capital appreciation, or both, rather than for use in the production or supply of goods or services, or for administrative purposes. To put it simply, if you buy a building to rent out or hold it to increase in value over time, that property is considered an investment property. Ravi's eyes lit up with understanding. So, if I buy a space and rent it out to another bookstore, that would count as an investment property? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. Investment properties can include land or buildings, and they are typically distinguished from properties that are used directly in your business operations. For example, the space where you operate your bookstore is not an investment property because it is used for your business activities. Ravi raised his hand, curiosity bubbling. How do I account for investment properties in my financial statements? The teacher replied, under Indus 40, you can choose between two models for accounting for investment properties, the cost model and the fair value model. If you adopt the cost model, you will measure the investment property at cost, less accumulated depreciation and any impairment losses. Conversely, if you opt for the fair value model, you will measure the investment property at its fair value, with changes recognized in profit or loss. Ravi pondered this for a moment. What are the benefits of using the fair value model? The teacher explained, the fair value model provides a more current view of the property's value, reflecting market conditions. This approach can be particularly beneficial if property values are changing rapidly. However, it requires regular revaluations and a reliable measurement process. On the other hand, the cost model is simpler and requires less frequent assessments. Ravi raised his hand again, eager for more information. Are there any specific disclosures I need to make about investment properties? Great question, the teacher said. Yes, Indus 40 requires specific disclosures. You must disclose the measurement basis used, the fair value of investment properties if you are using the cost model, and details about any restrictions on the property. Additionally, if you have any rental income or operating expenses related to the property, those should be disclosed as well. Ravi thought about this for a moment. So, keeping track of all this information is crucial for transparency and compliance. Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. Properly accounting for investment properties not only ensures compliance with Indus 40 but also provides valuable information to stakeholders about your financial position and the potential income from your investments. As the class drew to a close, Ravi felt a sense of excitement about the possibilities that investment properties could offer. He understood the importance of distinguishing between operational and investment properties, as well as the accounting methods and disclosures involved. 
With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt empowered to explore investment opportunities that could enhance his bookstore's financial future while ensuring compliance with accounting standards. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a serene afternoon, with the gentle sound of rustling leaves outside, Ravi entered the classroom, excited to discover what captivating story his teacher had prepared today. Known for transforming complex subjects into engaging narratives, the teacher was about to explore Indus 41, which deals with agriculture. Ravi could hardly wait to see how this would unfold. As the teacher walked in, he greeted the students with his signature warmth. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the fascinating world of agriculture and how it is accounted for in financial statements. Imagine, Ravi, that you are managing a family farm where you grow a variety of crops. This scenario will help us understand Indus 41. Ravi settled into his seat, intrigued by the idea. What does Indus 41 mean for my farm, sir? The teacher began, Indus 41 provides guidance on the accounting treatment for agricultural activity. Agricultural activity involves the management of biological assets, which include living plants and animals. For example, if you have a mango orchard, the trees are biological assets, and the mangoes produced are considered agricultural produce. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the concept. So, the mango trees are an asset because they can generate income? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. Under Indus 41, biological assets must be measured at their fair value less cost to sell. This means you need to estimate the value of your mango trees based on market prices, minus any costs associated with selling the mangoes. This measurement ensures that your financial statements reflect the true value of your agricultural assets. Ravi raised his hand, eager to learn more. What about the crops that I harvest? How do I account for them? The teacher replied, once you harvest the crops, they become agricultural produce. At the point of harvest, you should measure them at their fair value less cost to sell. This becomes your inventory, which you will recognize in your financial statements. For example, once you pick the mangoes, you would record their value as inventory until you sell them. Ravi considered this for a moment. What happens if the value of my biological assets changes over time? Do I need to keep adjusting their value in my accounts? Yes, Ravi, the teacher said enthusiastically. You will need to re-measure your biological assets at each reporting date. If the fair value changes, you recognize those changes in profit or loss. This process ensures that your financial statements remain accurate and reflective of your farm's performance. Ravi thought about this and raised another question. What if I face challenges like diseases affecting my crops? How would that impact my financial statements? The teacher nodded thoughtfully. Good question. If your biological assets face impairment due to disease or adverse weather conditions, you must assess whether their carrying amount exceeds their recoverable amount. If it does, you will need to recognize an impairment loss in your financial statements. This practice ensures that your financial position is accurately represented, even in difficult times. Ravi was captivated. So, managing a farm not only involves growing crops but also keeping track of their financial value and being prepared for challenges? Precisely, Ravi, the teacher replied. By understanding and applying Indus 41, you can effectively manage your farm's resources, ensuring that you remain informed about the value of your biological assets and agricultural produce. This knowledge empowers you to make better decisions for your farm's future. As the class came to a close, Ravi left feeling inspired and knowledgeable about the intricacies of agricultural accounting. He understood the significance of measuring biological assets and the importance of fair value assessments in ensuring that his financial statements accurately reflected the performance of his family farm. With this newfound understanding, Ravi felt ready to embrace the world of agriculture, equipped with the tools to manage both his crops and his finances effectively. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and sunny afternoon, Ravi entered the classroom with an eager smile, ready to immerse himself in another fascinating lesson from his renowned teacher. Today, the subject was Indus 101, which focuses on the first-time adoption of Indian accounting standards. Ravi could not wait to see how his teacher would weave this complex topic into an engaging story. As the teacher settled in front of the class, he greeted the students warmly. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will embark on a journey to understand what it means to adopt Indian accounting standards for the first time. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you have decided to transform your existing bookstore into a larger, more dynamic business, and you are now ready to adopt the Indian accounting standards for the first time. This scenario will help us explore Indus 101. 
Ravi's curiosity was piqued. What does it mean to adopt these standards for the first time, sir? The teacher began, Indus 101 is the framework that guides entities like your bookstore on how to transition from previous accounting standards to Indian accounting standards. This transition is significant because it requires a comprehensive understanding of the new principles and how they affect your financial statements. Think of it as preparing for a new adventure with new rules. Ravi nodded, intrigued by the idea. So, what are the steps I need to take to adopt these standards? The teacher explained, first, you need to determine your date of transition, which is the date when you start applying in DAS. On this date, you will prepare an opening balance sheet that complies with the new standards. This balance sheet acts as a snapshot of your financial position, reflecting the values of your assets, liabilities, and equity under INDAS. Ravi raised his hand, eager to understand more. What about the figures in my previous financial statements? Do I need to adjust those? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher said enthusiastically. Yes, you will need to adjust your previous financial statements to reflect any differences between the old accounting standards and the new INDAS. This adjustment process is known as reconciliation. You will create a reconciliation statement that outlines how your previous figures differ from the new figures under INDAS. Ravi thought deeply. What if there are areas where the new standards allow for different treatments? How do I decide what to do? The teacher nodded in understanding. Under INDAS 101, there are specific exemptions that you can choose from when transitioning. For instance, you may elect to apply certain exemptions for property, plant, and equipment or for financial instruments. This flexibility allows you to simplify the transition process while ensuring that your financial statements remain comparable. Ravi raised another hand, filled with questions. Is there any specific guidance on disclosures I need to make during this transition? Yes, there are, the teacher responded. INDAS 101 requires you to disclose information that enables users of your financial statements to understand how the transition has affected your financial position and performance. This includes details about your date of transition, the exemptions you have applied, and the impact on your opening balance sheet. As the lesson continued, Ravi became increasingly fascinated by the complexity and importance of adopting new accounting standards. He realized that this transition was not just about numbers but also about ensuring transparency and trust with stakeholders. So, adopting Indus for the first time is a significant step in growing my business, he asked. Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. By successfully navigating this transition, you not only comply with accounting standards but also position your bookstore for greater credibility and success in the marketplace. Your ability to present accurate and reliable financial information will instill confidence in your investors, customers, and other stakeholders. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left feeling enlightened about the journey of adopting Indus 101. He understood the steps involved in the transition, the importance of reconciling previous financial figures, and the need for clear disclosures. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt empowered and ready to embark on his business adventure, confident that he could successfully manage the transition to Indian accounting standards while ensuring the future growth and integrity of his bookstore. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a lively afternoon, as the sun streamed through the classroom windows, Ravi arrived with a sense of curiosity about the day's lesson. His teacher, known for his captivating storytelling abilities, was ready to delve into the topic of Indus 102, which pertains to share-based payment. Ravi eagerly took his seat, eager to see how his teacher would bring this concept to life. As the teacher settled in front of the class, he greeted the students with a warm smile. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the intriguing world of share-based payments. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you have started a new tech company, and you want to attract talented employees by offering them shares in your business as part of their compensation. This scenario will help us understand Indus 102. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. So, what does it mean to offer shares as payment, sir? The teacher began, share-based payment occurs when a company provides its employees with shares or share options as part of their remuneration. This practice aligns the interests of the employees with the company's performance, motivating them to contribute to its success. Under INDAS 102, you will need to recognize the expense associated with share-based payments in your financial statements. Ravi's eyes widened. How do I calculate the expense for the shares I give to my employees? The teacher explained, the expense is measured at the fair value of the shares or share options granted at the grant date. For example, if you decide to give your employees options to purchase shares at a specific price, you will need to assess the fair value of those options at the time they are granted. 
This value is then expensed over the vesting period, which is the period during which the employees must work to earn those options. Ravi raised his hand, eager for clarity. What if the share price increases significantly after I grant the options? Does that change the expense? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. The fair value you calculated at the grant date remains the same, regardless of future changes in share price. However, if the options are exercised, the company recognizes additional equity and reflects that in its financial statements. The initial expense related to the options will not change due to fluctuations in market prices. Ravi thought deeply about this concept. Are there any specific requirements for disclosures I need to make regarding share-based payments? Yes, indeed, the teacher responded. Indus 102 requires companies to provide detailed disclosures about share-based payment arrangements. You must disclose information such as the number of options granted, the exercise price, and the fair value of the options. These disclosures help stakeholders understand the impact of share-based payments on the company's financial position and performance. Ravi's interest was piqued. What happens if I decide to cancel or modify the share-based payment plan? The teacher nodded. If you cancel or modify the share-based payment arrangement, you will need to recognize the remaining expense immediately, regardless of the original vesting schedule. The new arrangement's fair value will also need to be assessed to determine the impact on your financial statements. As the lesson progressed, Ravi became increasingly fascinated by the concept of share-based payments. He realized that this approach not only incentivized employees but also required careful consideration in accounting for expenses and disclosures. So, using share-based payments can be beneficial for my company, but it also involves responsibilities in accounting, he asked. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. Share-based payments can help attract and retain talent while aligning employees' interests with the company's success. However, it's crucial to adhere to the accounting standards to ensure transparency and accuracy in your financial reporting. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left feeling enlightened about the intricacies of Indus 102. He understood how to measure share-based payments, the importance of fair value assessments, and the necessity of proper disclosures. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt empowered and ready to navigate the world of share-based payments, confident that he could attract talented individuals to his tech company while ensuring compliance with accounting standards. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a crisp afternoon, with the golden sun casting a warm glow across the classroom, Ravi entered, excited to discover what captivating lesson his teacher had prepared today. Renowned for his ability to make complex topics engaging, the teacher was set to explore the concept of Indus 103, which focuses on business combinations. Ravi could hardly wait to see how this would unfold. As the teacher entered the room, he greeted the students with his usual warmth. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to dive into the world of business combinations. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you have successfully built a small but popular bakery, and now you want to acquire another bakery to expand your business. This scenario will help us understand Indus 103. Ravi settled in his seat, intrigued by the idea. What does it mean to acquire another business, sir? The teacher began, a business combination occurs when one company obtains control over another company. This could happen through acquiring its assets, shares, or even a merger. Under Indus 103, it is essential to determine whether the transaction is a business combination, and if it is, you need to account for it appropriately. Ravi nodded, starting to grasp the concept. So, what are the steps I need to take when acquiring another bakery? First, the teacher explained, you need to identify the acquirer. In your case, as the owner of your bakery, you will be the acquirer. Next, you must determine the acquisition date, which is the date when you obtain control over the other bakery. Ravi raised his hand, eager for more information. What does it mean to have control over another business? The teacher replied, control is the power to govern the financial and operating policies of the acquired business to obtain benefits from its activities. This means having the ability to make decisions about how the business operates. For example, if you purchase more than 50% of the shares in the other bakery, you gain control and can influence its direction. Ravi pondered this and asked, what about the assets and liabilities of the bakery I am acquiring? How do I account for those? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher continued. When you acquire another business, you must recognize the identifiable assets acquired and the liabilities assumed at their fair values on the acquisition date. This process is known as the purchase method of accounting. For instance, if the other bakery has equipment, inventory, and a lease agreement, you will need to determine the fair values of these assets and liabilities at the time of acquisition. 
Ravi's curiosity grew. What happens if the fair value of the assets exceeds the purchase price I paid for the bakery? The teacher explained, if the fair value of the net assets acquired exceeds the purchase price, you may have a situation called negative goodwill. In such cases, you would need to reassess the fair values of the assets and liabilities to ensure accuracy. However, typically, when you acquire a business, the purchase price is based on the value of the whole business, including any goodwill. This represents the excess of the purchase price over the fair value of net identifiable assets. Ravi thought for a moment. So, goodwill is like a premium I pay for the reputation and customer loyalty of the acquired bakery? Exactly, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. Goodwill reflects the intangible benefits of acquiring the business, such as its brand value, customer relationships, and synergies you expect to achieve. Under Indus 103, you will also need to test goodwill for impairment annually, which means assessing whether its carrying amount exceeds its recoverable amount. As the lesson drew to a close, Ravi felt enlightened about the concept of business combinations. He understood the importance of identifying the acquirer, recognizing assets and liabilities, and accounting for goodwill. So, acquiring another business is not just about the numbers but also about understanding the value behind them, he asked. Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher responded. A successful business combination requires careful consideration of both financial and strategic aspects. By adhering to Indus 103, you can ensure that your financial statements accurately reflect the impact of the acquisition, providing clarity to stakeholders. As the class ended, Ravi left feeling empowered with a comprehensive understanding of Indus 103. He realized that navigating a business combination involved both financial acumen and strategic foresight. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt ready to explore the possibilities of expanding his bakery through acquisitions, confident in his ability to manage the complexities of business combinations effectively. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a breezy afternoon, as the leaves danced gently outside the classroom, Ravi entered with a spark of curiosity about the day's lesson. His teacher, celebrated for his engaging storytelling, was ready to delve into the intricate world of Indus 104, which focuses on insurance contracts. Ravi settled in, eager to see how his teacher would illuminate this complex topic. As the teacher greeted the students, he smiled and said, Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the fascinating realm of insurance contracts. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you have just opened a new insurance agency, and you are eager to understand how to account for the insurance contracts you sell. This scenario will help us grasp the principles of Indus 104. Ravi leaned in, intrigued. So, what are insurance contracts, sir? The teacher began, an insurance contract is an agreement between the insurer and the policyholder, where the insurer promises to compensate the policyholder for certain risks in exchange for a premium. Under Indus 104, it is crucial to recognize how these contracts are accounted for in the financial statements. Ravi nodded, wanting to delve deeper. What are the key components I need to understand about these contracts? Great question, Ravi, the teacher responded enthusiastically. There are several key aspects to consider. First, you must determine whether the contract meets the definition of an insurance contract. This involves assessing whether the contract transfers significant insurance risk from the policyholder to the insurer. If it does, it qualifies as an insurance contract under Indus 104. Ravi raised his hand, eager to know more. How do I measure the premiums I receive from policyholders? The premiums you receive from policyholders are initially recognized as liabilities, as they represent your obligation to provide coverage. Over time, you will recognize these premiums as revenue, but this process involves estimating the expected future claims and expenses associated with those contracts, the teacher explained. Ravi's curiosity grew. What about claims? How do I account for them? Claims are a significant aspect of insurance contracts, the teacher continued. You must estimate the expected claims to be paid out to policyholders. This estimation process is crucial as it affects your financial statements. You will recognize a liability for claims incurred but not yet paid, known as the claims liability. It's essential to regularly review and adjust these estimates to reflect the current circumstances. Ravi thought for a moment before asking, what happens if the premiums collected exceed the claims paid out? How do I account for that? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher responded. In such cases, the difference between the premiums collected and the claims paid contributes to your profit. However, you must also consider the potential for future claims and expenses, which is why you will maintain reserves to cover these uncertainties. 
these reserves are essential for ensuring the insurer's ability to meet its future obligations. Ravi listened intently, wanting to grasp the full picture. Are there specific disclosures I need to make regarding these insurance contracts? Yes, there are indeed, the teacher affirmed. INDAS 104 requires you to disclose comprehensive information about your insurance contracts, including the nature and extent of risks, the methodologies used for estimating claims, and the basis for recognizing revenue. These disclosures help stakeholders understand the financial position and performance of your insurance agency. As the class progressed, Ravi became increasingly fascinated by the intricacies of insurance contracts. He realized that the world of insurance was not just about selling policies but also about managing risks and ensuring transparency. So, understanding insurance contracts is crucial for running my agency successfully, he asked. Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. By adhering to Indus 104, you can ensure that your financial statements accurately reflect the performance of your insurance agency. This will foster trust with policyholders and investors alike, which is vital for your agency's success. As the lesson drew to a close, Ravi left feeling empowered with a deeper understanding of Indus 104. He grasped how to account for insurance contracts, estimate premiums and claims, and ensure compliance with disclosure requirements. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt ready to navigate the exciting world of insurance, confident in his ability to manage the complexities of his new agency effectively. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny afternoon, as birds chirped cheerfully outside, Ravi entered his classroom, eager to discover what his teacher had prepared for today's lesson. Renowned for his captivating storytelling, the teacher was ready to explain the concept of Indus 105, which deals with non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. Ravi took his seat, curious to see how this complex topic would unfold through a story. As the teacher began, he greeted the students warmly. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore a crucial aspect of financial reporting, Indus 105. Let's imagine, Ravi, that you are the owner of a successful manufacturing business. However, you've decided to sell one of your divisions, which produces specialized equipment. This situation will help us understand the principles behind non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. Ravi leaned in, intrigued by the scenario. What does it mean to have non-current assets held for sale, sir? The teacher explained, non-current assets are typically long-term assets that a business intends to keep for more than a year, like buildings and machinery. However, when a company decides to sell these assets, they become classified as held for sale under Indus 105. For an asset to be classified this way, it must be available for immediate sale in its current condition and must be highly probable that the sale will occur within a year. Ravi nodded, beginning to understand. So, if I want to sell the division, what steps do I need to take? First, you need to assess the carrying amount of the assets associated with that division, the teacher said. If the carrying amount exceeds the fair value less cost to sell, you may have to recognize an impairment loss. This means you will have to adjust the value of the assets downward on your balance sheet. Ravi raised his hand, eager to learn more. What happens to the profits and losses related to this division during the sale process? The profits or losses from the discontinued operation must be presented separately in your income statement, the teacher replied. This transparency is essential as it allows stakeholders to see the ongoing performance of your remaining operations without the impact of the discontinued division. For example, if your specialized equipment division was generating losses, you would disclose those losses separately to show the financial health of your core business. Ravi thought for a moment before asking, what if the sale takes longer than expected? Does that change how I report the assets? Good question, the teacher responded. If the criteria fourth held for sale are no longer met, you will need to reclassify those assets back to non-current assets and measure them at the lower of their carrying amount or fair value. This reclassification reflects the ongoing nature of your operations and ensures accurate reporting. Ravi listened intently, wanting to grasp the entire process. Are there any specific disclosures I must make when I decide to sell a division? Yes, indeed, the teacher confirmed. Indus 105 requires detailed disclosures about non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. You must provide information about the nature of the discontinued operations, the reasons for the sale, and the expected financial impact. This helps users of your financial statements understand the implications of your decisions. As the lesson progressed, Ravi became increasingly fascinated by the concept of non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. 
he realized that these aspects of financial reporting were vital for maintaining transparency and accuracy in his business's financial health. So, understanding how to report these assets is crucial for my manufacturing business, he asked. Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. By adhering to Indus 105, you can ensure that your financial statements accurately reflect the impact of the sale, providing clarity to investors and stakeholders about the ongoing operations of your business. As the class drew to a close, Ravi left feeling enlightened about Indus 105. He grasped how to classify non-current assets held for sale, recognize impairment losses, and report discontinued operations separately. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt ready to navigate the complexities of selling a division in his manufacturing business, confident in his ability to manage the reporting requirements effectively. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a vibrant afternoon, with the sun casting a warm glow through the classroom windows, Ravi walked in, excited for another enlightening lesson. His teacher, renowned for his storytelling prowess, was ready to explore a fascinating topic, Indus 106, which focuses on the exploration for and evaluation of mineral resources. Ravi settled into his seat, eager to see how his teacher would weave this complex concept into an engaging narrative. As the teacher greeted the class with a smile, he began, Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will embark on an adventure into the world of mineral resources. Imagine, Ravi, that you are the manager of a mining company exploring four precious minerals. Your journey will help us understand the principles of Indus 106. Ravi's eyes lit up with curiosity. What does it mean to explore four mineral resources, sir? The teacher responded, exploration involves searching four valuable minerals beneath the Earth's surface. This process requires significant investment in research, surveys, and drilling to determine the viability of mineral deposits. Under Indus 106, the costs incurred during this exploration phase are critical to how you account for your assets. Ravi leaned forward, eager to learn more. So, how do I account for these exploration costs? Great question, the teacher replied enthusiastically. According to Indus 106, you can choose to capitalize these exploration costs if certain conditions are met. Specifically, if you can demonstrate that it is likely that you will discover economically viable mineral resources, then you can treat those exploration costs as an asset on your balance sheet. This is known as capitalizing the costs. Ravi was intrigued but had another question. What happens if the exploration does not yield any mineral resources? The scenario where exploration does not result in viable resources is significant, the teacher explained. In such cases, you will need to write off the capitalized costs as an expense in your profit and loss statement. This reflects the reality that the investment did not lead to beneficial resources. Regularly assessing the viability of your exploration projects is crucial. Ravi thought deeply about the process. What if I find some promising resources? How do I proceed with accounting? Once you identify a mineral resource that is economically viable, you move from exploration to evaluation, the teacher clarified. This involves more detailed assessment and development costs, which can also be capitalized. You will need to determine whether the resource can be extracted profitably, and this evaluation can lead to the recognition of a tangible asset. Curiosity sparked in Ravi's mind. Are there any important disclosures I must make regarding these exploration and evaluation costs? Yes, absolutely, the teacher affirmed. Indus 106 mandates that you disclose significant information about your exploration and evaluation activities. This includes details about the nature of the resources, the methods used to assess them, and any uncertainties that may affect the valuation of these assets. Transparency is vital for stakeholders to understand the risks and opportunities involved in your mining operations. As the lesson continued, Ravi became increasingly captivated by the intricacies of Indus 106. He realized that managing the accounting for exploration and evaluation activities was essential for the success of a mining company. So, understanding how to capitalize and evaluate these costs is crucial for my mining business, he asked with growing confidence. Exactly, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. By adhering to Indus 106, you can ensure that your financial statements accurately reflect the potential of your mineral resources, helping investors and stakeholders make informed decisions about your company's future. As the class came to a close, Ravi left feeling empowered with a deeper understanding of Indus 106. He grasped how to account for exploration costs, manage evaluations, and provide necessary disclosures about mineral resources. 
With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt ready to navigate the complexities of the mining industry, confident in his ability to effectively manage the financial aspects of his future endeavors in mineral exploration. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and bustling afternoon, Ravi entered his classroom, eager for the day's lesson. His teacher, known for transforming complex subjects into captivating stories, was prepared to introduce a new concept, Indus 107, which focuses on the disclosures related to financial instruments. Ravi settled into his seat, curious to learn how this essential topic would unfold through storytelling. As the teacher began, he welcomed the students with his characteristic warmth. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will delve into the fascinating world of financial instruments and the importance of disclosures. Let's imagine that Ravi here is the chief financial officer of a growing company that deals in various financial instruments, such as stocks, bonds, and derivatives. This scenario will help us understand Indus 107. Ravi perked up, intrigued by the narrative. What exactly are financial instruments, sir? The teacher explained, financial instruments are contracts that create financial assets for one entity and financial liabilities or equity instruments for another. They include a wide range of assets, such as cash, stocks, and bonds, as well as obligations like loans and derivatives. Understanding these instruments is crucial for effective financial management. Ravi nodded, trying to absorb the information. So, how do I manage the disclosures related to these instruments? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher responded enthusiastically. Indus 107 requires that entities provide detailed disclosures about their financial instruments to ensure transparency and help users of the financial statements understand the risks associated with them. As a chief financial officer, you must provide information about the nature, extent, and risks of these instruments. Ravi leaned forward, keen to learn more. What specific disclosures should I include? The teacher continued, you must disclose the fair value of your financial instruments, which provides a snapshot of their market value at a specific point in time. Additionally, you need to describe how you measure fair value, including the methodologies used and any assumptions made. This helps stakeholders understand how the reported values were derived. Ravi's curiosity deepened. What about the risks? How do I report those? Great observation, the teacher replied. You must disclose the risks associated with financial instruments, including credit risk, liquidity risk, and market risk. For each type of risk, you should explain how these risks are managed and the potential impact on your financial statements. This transparency allows investors and creditors to assess the financial health of your company effectively. As the teacher spoke, Ravi began to see the bigger picture. Are there any particular events or changes that I need to report on? Indeed, the teacher affirmed. Indus 107 also requires disclosures about any significant changes in the valuation of financial instruments from one reporting period to the next. If there are major changes in the market or significant risks that have emerged, you must report those, as they can affect stakeholders' decisions. Ravi contemplated this information. So, maintaining accurate and transparent disclosures is crucial for building trust with investors and stakeholders? Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. By providing comprehensive disclosures in accordance with Indus 107, you help stakeholders make informed decisions based on a clear understanding of your company's financial position. This transparency not only enhances credibility but also strengthens relationships with investors and creditors. As the lesson drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom with a newfound appreciation for the complexities of Indus 107. He understood how to manage the disclosures related to financial instruments, emphasizing transparency and risk management. With this knowledge, Ravi felt empowered to navigate the financial landscape of his future company, confident in his ability to foster trust and understanding among stakeholders through diligent reporting. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a vibrant afternoon, Ravi walked into his classroom, filled with anticipation for another engaging lesson from his teacher, renowned for his storytelling skills. Today, the teacher was set to unveil the concept of Indus 108, which focuses on operating segments within a business. Ravi settled into his seat, eager to see how the story would unfold. With a warm smile, the teacher greeted the class. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will explore the world of operating segments. Imagine that Ravi here is the manager of a diverse company that operates in multiple industries, including technology, manufacturing, and retail. This scenario will help us understand Indus 108. Ravi's eyes widened with interest. What exactly is an operating segment, sir? 
the teacher explained, an operating segment is a part of a business that generates revenue and incurs expenses, whose operating results are regularly reviewed by the company's management to make decisions about resources allocated to the segment and assess its performance. It allows stakeholders to understand the different components of your business. Ravi nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. So, how do I determine which parts of my business qualify as operating segments? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. Under Indus 108, an operating segment must meet certain criteria. It should be engaged in activities that earn revenues and incur expenses, and its results should be reviewed by the company's chief operating decision maker. Furthermore, segments are often reported based on internal management reports, which can vary from company to company. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. What kind of information should I disclose about these operating segments? An excellent inquiry, the teacher responded enthusiastically. You are required to disclose specific information about each operating segment, including its revenue, profit or loss, and assets. This information helps stakeholders understand how different segments contribute to the overall performance of the company. Moreover, you should also disclose the factors used to identify and differentiate segments, as well as any changes to those segments over time. Ravi contemplated this idea. What if I have segments that are not performing well? How should I handle that in my disclosures? Transparency is key, Ravi, the teacher affirmed. If an operating segment is not performing well, you should disclose that information as well. It's important to provide insights into why a segment may be underperforming and any strategies you have in place to address those challenges. This helps investors and stakeholders assess the overall health of the business and make informed decisions. Ravi raised another question. Are there any other important disclosures I should be aware of? Yes, indeed, the teacher continued. Indus 108 also requires you to provide reconciliations between the total of the operating segment's revenues, profit or loss, and assets to the corresponding totals in the financial statements. This ensures that stakeholders can see how the segment information aligns with the overall financial reporting of the company. As the lesson continued, Ravi became increasingly fascinated by the intricacies of Indus 108. He realized that understanding operating segments was vital for effective management and reporting within his future company. So, being clear about my operating segments will help build trust with investors and stakeholders, he asked. Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. By adhering to Indus 108, you can provide valuable insights into the various components of your business, enhancing transparency and helping stakeholders make informed decisions about your company's performance. As the class came to a close, Ravi left feeling empowered with a deeper understanding of Indus 108. He grasped how to identify and disclose information about operating segments, recognizing the importance of transparency and performance management. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt ready to navigate the complexities of managing a diverse business, confident in his ability to provide meaningful insights to stakeholders about the different operating segments and their contributions to overall success. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny afternoon, Ravi strolled into his classroom, excited for another lesson from his teacher, known for his captivating storytelling abilities. Today, the teacher was ready to delve into a vital topic, Indus 109, which deals with financial instruments. Ravi settled into his seat, eager to see how the story would unfold. With a welcoming smile, the teacher began, Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will embark on an adventure through the world of financial instruments. Let's imagine that Ravi here is the chief financial officer of a thriving company that deals with various financial instruments, such as loans, investments, and derivatives. This scenario will guide us in understanding Indus 109. Ravi's interest peaked, and he asked, What exactly are financial instruments, sir? The teacher responded, Financial instruments are contracts that create financial assets for one party and financial liabilities or equity instruments for another. They can include a range of items like cash, stocks, bonds, and even complex derivatives. Understanding these instruments is essential for managing a company's financial health. Ravi nodded, absorbing the information. How do I account for these financial instruments under Indus 109? Great question, the teacher replied enthusiastically. Indus 109 outlines a comprehensive framework for classifying, measuring, and recognizing financial instruments. It requires you to categorize these instruments into three main classifications, financial assets measured at amortized cost, financial assets measured at fair value through other comprehensive income, and financial assets measured at fair value through profit or loss. Ravi leaned forward, intrigued. 
Can you explain what each of these classifications means? Of course, the teacher continued. Financial assets measured at amortized cost are typically loans and receivables that you intend to hold until maturity. These are measured at their initial cost minus any principal repayments and impairment losses. On the other hand, financial assets measured at fair value through other comprehensive income include equity instruments that you choose to measure this way. Changes in fair value are recorded in other comprehensive income until the asset is sold. Lastly, financial assets measured at fair value through profit or loss are those that you hold for trading, with changes in fair value recognized directly in profit or loss. Ravi thought deeply about this. What about the liabilities? How do I account for those? Excellent question, Ravi, the teacher responded. Financial liabilities can also be classified into two categories, those measured at amortized cost and those measured at fair value through profit or loss. Similar to financial assets, if you intend to hold a liability until it is settled, you will measure it at amortized cost. However, if you are trading or it is designated at fair value, any changes will be recognized in profit or loss. Ravi raised another point. What about impairment? How does it fit into this framework? Impairment is crucial, the teacher affirmed. Under Indus 109, you are required to assess the expected credit losses on financial assets measured at amortized cost or at fair value through other comprehensive income. This involves estimating the potential losses over the life of the asset, ensuring that your financial statements reflect any risks associated with your financial instruments. As the teacher explained the importance of these classifications, Ravi started to see the bigger picture. So, managing financial instruments effectively will help ensure the financial health of my company, exactly, Ravi, the teacher confirmed, by adhering to Indus 109, you can provide accurate financial information, allowing stakeholders to assess the risks and opportunities associated with your financial instruments. This transparency fosters trust and aids in informed decision-making. As the lesson drew to a close, Ravi left the classroom with a newfound understanding of Indus 109. He grasped how to classify, measure, and account for various financial instruments, recognizing the importance of impairment assessments. With this knowledge, Ravi felt ready to navigate the complexities of financial management in his future career, confident in his ability to maintain the financial health of his company while providing transparent information to stakeholders. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright and sunny day, Ravi entered his classroom with a sense of excitement. He knew that his teacher, renowned for his storytelling abilities, would once again weave a fascinating tale to help him understand complex concepts. Today's lesson was about Indus 110, focusing on consolidated financial statements. Ravi settled into his seat, eager to discover how this concept would be presented. With a warm smile, the teacher greeted the class, good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will embark on a journey into the world of consolidated financial statements. To help us understand this concept, let's imagine that Ravi here owns a company called Tech Innovations, which has recently acquired two other companies, Smart Gadgets and Green Solutions. Ravi perked up, intrigued by the story. So, what does this mean for my companies, sir? The teacher continued, when a parent company like Tech Innovations acquires one or more subsidiaries like Smart Gadgets and Green Solutions, it is essential to present a true and fair view of the financial position and performance of the entire group. This is where Indus 110 comes into play, requiring you to prepare consolidated financial statements. Ravi was curious. What exactly are consolidated financial statements? The teacher explained, consolidated financial statements combine the financial information at the parent company and its subsidiaries into a single set of financial statements. This provides a clear picture of the financial health and performance of the entire group, rather than just the parent company alone. Why is this important? Ravi asked, seeking clarity. Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. Consolidated financial statements are crucial for stakeholders, including investors, creditors, and regulators, as they provide insights into the overall resources and obligations of the group. It allows them to assess the financial position, profitability, and cash flows of the entire entity, leading to better informed decisions. Ravi nodded, beginning to understand. How do I prepare these consolidated financial statements? Good question, the teacher said. Under Indus 110, you need to follow a few steps. First, identify the subsidiaries that you control, meaning you have the power to govern their financial and operating policies. Control typically exists when you own more than 50% of the voting rights, but it can also arise from agreements or other arrangements. Ravi leaned in closer. What's next? 
Once you've identified the subsidiaries, you need to combine their financial statements with those of the parent company, the teacher continued. This involves adding together similar items like assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses. It's crucial to eliminate any intercompany transactions, such as sales between the parent and subsidiaries, to avoid double counting. Ravi's eyes widened. That sounds a bit complicated. Are there any specific adjustments I need to make? Yes, Ravi, there are indeed some important adjustments, the teacher affirmed. You must account for the non-controlling interest, which represents the portion of equity in the subsidiary not owned by the parent. This will appear in the consolidated balance sheet and income statement. Furthermore, any fair value adjustments made at the time of acquisition must also be considered in the consolidation process. So, if I purchase a subsidiary at a premium, I need to reflect that in the consolidated statements? Ravi asked. Exactly, the teacher said enthusiastically. You must recognize the fair value of the identifiable assets and liabilities of the subsidiary at the acquisition date. Any excess paid beyond the fair value of net assets is recorded as goodwill in the consolidated financial statements. Ravi pondered this information. What if my subsidiaries have different accounting policies? Another great point, Ravi, the teacher replied. When preparing consolidated financial statements, you must ensure that the financial statements of the subsidiaries are adjusted to align with the accounting policies of the parent company. This ensures consistency and comparability within the consolidated statements. As the lesson progressed, Ravi began to see the importance of Indus 110. So, by consolidating the financial statements, I can provide a complete picture of my group's financial performance to stakeholders? Absolutely, Ravi, the teacher confirmed. Consolidated financial statements not only reflect the true financial position of the group but also enhance transparency and build trust with stakeholders. They can see how each subsidiary contributes to the overall success of the parent company. As the class came to a close, Ravi left feeling empowered with a solid understanding of Indus 110. He grasped how to identify subsidiaries, prepare consolidated financial statements, and make necessary adjustments. With this knowledge, Ravi felt ready to navigate the complexities of financial reporting in a group structure, confident in his ability to provide meaningful insights to stakeholders about the collective performance of his companies. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright afternoon, Ravi walked into his classroom, bubbling with anticipation. His teacher, known for his engaging storytelling techniques, was ready to unfold another captivating lesson. Today, they would explore Indus 111, which deals with joint arrangements. Ravi settled into his seat, eager to see how this topic would be brought to life. With a cheerful smile, the teacher greeted the class, Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to embark on an exciting journey into the world of joint arrangements. To illustrate this concept, let's imagine that Ravi here is part of a team of young entrepreneurs who have decided to come together to start a new business called EcoTech, focusing on environmentally friendly technology solutions. Ravi's curiosity grew as he listened. What kind of arrangements can we make in this business, sir? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied enthusiastically. In the realm of Indus 111, there are two main types of joint arrangements, joint operations and joint ventures. Let's explore each of these with the help of your Echo Tech venture. Ravi leaned forward, ready to absorb the information. How does a joint operation work? The teacher explained, in a joint operation, the parties involved have rights to the assets and obligations for the liabilities of the arrangement. Imagine that you and your partners decide to jointly develop a new solar panel technology. Each partner contributes resources, such as equipment and expertise, and you share the profits and losses directly based on the resources contributed. Sounds interesting, Ravi exclaimed. So, I would report my share of the assets, liabilities, and income from this project in my own financial statements? Exactly, the teacher affirmed. Under Indus 111, you will recognize your share of the assets and liabilities of the joint operation, as well as your proportionate share of the revenue and expenses generated. This ensures that the financial statements accurately reflect your involvement in the operation. Ravi considered this for a moment. And what about joint ventures? How do they differ? Excellent inquiry, Ravi, the teacher said, pleased. In a joint venture, the parties have rights to the net assets of the arrangement. This typically involves creating a separate legal entity, such as a partnership or a limited liability company. Let's say you and your partners decide to establish a new company called Echo Innovations to develop and sell green technology products. Here, Echo Innovations becomes a separate entity, and each of you will own shares in it. 
So, I wouldn't directly report the assets and liabilities of Echo Innovations in my own financial statements, Ravi asked for clarification. Correct, the teacher confirmed. Instead, you would account for your investment in Echo Innovations using the equity method. This means you will initially recognize your investment at cost, and subsequently, you will adjust your investment to reflect your share of the profit or loss of the joint venture. Ravi thought deeply about this. What happens if the joint venture makes a profit or incurs a loss? Good question, the teacher replied. If Echo Innovations makes a profit, you will increase your investment value in your financial statements by your share of the profit. Conversely, if it incurs a loss, you will decrease your investment accordingly. This ensures that your financial statements reflect the performance of your investment in the joint venture. Ravi nodded, feeling more comfortable with the concepts. Are there any specific disclosures I need to keep in mind when reporting joint arrangements? Yes, there are indeed important disclosures, the teacher explained. Under Indus 111, you are required to disclose key information about the joint arrangements you are involved in, including the nature of the arrangements, your share of assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses, as well as any commitments related to the arrangements. This transparency is vital for stakeholders to understand your involvement in joint operations or ventures. As the lesson came to an end, Ravi felt enlightened about Indus 111. He now understood the differences between joint operations and joint ventures, how to report them in financial statements, and the importance of transparency in disclosures. With this newfound knowledge, Ravi felt equipped to navigate the complexities of joint arrangements in his future entrepreneurial endeavors, confident that he could effectively manage and report on collaborations with other businesses. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a rainy afternoon, Ravi stepped into his classroom, looking forward to another captivating lesson from his teacher, who was renowned for his storytelling prowess. Today, the class was set to delve into Indus 112, which focuses on the disclosure of interests in other entities. Ravi settled into his seat, curious about how this complex topic would unfold through a story. With a bright smile, the teacher greeted the students, Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we will embark on a journey exploring the world of financial disclosures, particularly focusing on Indus 112. To make this concept clearer, let's imagine Ravi here has been quite busy with various ventures. In addition to his work with Echo Tech and Echo Innovations, he has also invested in two other companies, Green Energy Solutions and Sustainable Products Company. Ravi's interest peaked as he listened. What does this mean for my investments, sir? The teacher continued, excellent question, Ravi. As you invest in these companies, it becomes essential for you to disclose your interests in them, especially when preparing your financial statements. Under Indus 112, there are certain key disclosures you must make about your interests in other entities, which can include subsidiaries, joint arrangements, and associates. Ravi furrowed his brow, trying to grasp the idea. So, what exactly should I disclose about these companies? Great inquiry, the teacher replied. You will need to provide information about the nature of your interest in each entity, including the type of relationship you have with them. For instance, are they subsidiaries where you hold significant control, joint ventures where you share control, or associates where you have significant influence but not control? Ravi nodded, beginning to understand. And how do I determine what constitutes significant influence? The teacher explained, typically, significant influence exists when you hold between 20% and 50% of the voting rights in a company. However, other factors, such as representation on the board of directors or participation in policymaking decisions, may also be considered. Got it. So, I need to clarify these relationships in my disclosures, Ravi said, connecting the dots. Exactly, the teacher affirmed. In addition to describing the nature of your interests, you must also disclose the financial impact of these investments on your own financial statements. This includes providing details about the carrying amount of the investments in subsidiaries, joint ventures, and associates. Ravi looked thoughtful. What if there are any restrictions on my rights to access the financial information of these entities? Good point, Ravi, the teacher continued. If there are restrictions on your ability to obtain information about the financial performance or position of the entities you are involved with, you need to disclose that as well. This enhances transparency for stakeholders who rely on your financial statements for decision-making. Ravi's eyes lit up with realization. So, the aim of these disclosures is to provide a complete picture of my interests in other entities. Precisely, the teacher responded enthusiastically. Indus 112 emphasizes transparency and accountability in financial reporting. 
it ensures that stakeholders, including investors, creditors, and regulators, have access to relevant information about your interests in other entities. This helps them assess the financial health and performance of your overall business operations. The class continued as Ravi's confidence grew. What else do I need to disclose about my interests? The teacher elaborated, you must also disclose the financial performance of these interests. For example, if your associates or joint ventures generate significant profits or losses, it is essential to include this information. Additionally, any transactions between your company and these entities must be disclosed, as they may impact the financial position of both parties. As the lesson drew to a close, Ravi felt empowered with a clearer understanding of Indus 112. He grasped the importance of disclosing his interests in other entities, recognizing the necessity of transparency in financial reporting. With this knowledge, Ravi was better prepared to navigate the complexities of his investments and ensure that he provided meaningful insights to stakeholders about his business ventures, all while fostering trust and accountability in his financial statements. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny afternoon, Ravi entered his classroom, eager to discover what captivating lesson awaited him. His teacher, well known for his storytelling flair, was ready to guide the students through the intricate world of Indus 113, which focuses on fair value measurement. Ravi settled into his seat, excited to learn how this complex topic would be conveyed through a story. With a warm smile, the teacher began, Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are going to explore the fascinating concept of fair value measurement. To make this clearer, let's imagine that Ravi here has recently started a small art gallery to showcase his talent for painting. He has several beautiful artworks, but he is unsure how to determine their value when he sells them. Ravi listened attentively as the teacher continued, in the world of accounting, fair value is defined as the price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. This definition will guide you as you assess the value of your artworks. So, sir, how do I determine the fair value of my paintings? Ravi asked, intrigued. The teacher responded, great question, Ravi. Under Indus 113, there are three key approaches to measuring fair value, the market approach, the income approach, and the cost approach. Let's explore each of these approaches using your art gallery as an example. Ravi leaned forward, eager to absorb the information. What is the market approach? The teacher explained, the market approach relies on observable market prices for similar assets. In your case, you could look at the prices of similar artworks sold in your local area or on online platforms. If you find a comparable painting that sold for 10,000 rupees, you might use this information to estimate the fair value of your artwork. Sounds logical, Ravi exclaimed. What about the income approach? The income approach, the teacher elaborated, is based on the future cash flows that an asset is expected to generate. For your paintings, you could estimate how much revenue you expect to earn from selling your artworks over time. By discounting those future cash flows to their present value, you can arrive at a fair value for your paintings. This method works well for assets that produce regular income. Interesting. And what is the cost approach? Ravi inquired, his curiosity deepening. The cost approach focuses on the amount it would take to replace or reproduce an asset, the teacher replied. In your case, this means considering the costs of materials and labor that went into creating your artwork. If it cost you 5,000 rupees to create a particular painting, you might use this figure as the fair value if you believe it accurately reflects the asset's value in the market. Ravi nodded, feeling more confident about the concept. So, I can choose the approach that best reflects the value of my paintings. Exactly, the teacher affirmed. However, it's crucial to note that the choice of approach should be based on the availability of data and the specific circumstances of the asset. Moreover, you need to ensure that the fair value measurements are consistent over time and disclose them appropriately in your financial statements. Ravi raised a hand, eager to understand more. What if there is no active market for my artworks? How can I measure their fair value then? The teacher smiled, a valid concern, Ravi. In such cases, you may need to use valuation techniques that incorporate market data and other relevant information to arrive at a fair value. This is where professional judgment comes into play, along with a deep understanding of the market and the specific asset. As the lesson continued, Ravi felt empowered by the knowledge of Indus 113. He realized the importance of fair value measurement in accurately reporting the value of his assets, ensuring that he could present his art gallery's financial position transparently and reliably. 
Finally, as the class drew to a close, the teacher reminded everyone, remember, fair value measurement is not just about numbers, it's about understanding the market dynamics and making informed decisions. With this knowledge, you will be able to navigate the complexities of valuing your assets with confidence. Ravi left the classroom that day feeling enlightened, ready to apply the principles of fair value measurement to his art gallery, ensuring that he could showcase his talents and manage his business effectively. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright morning, Ravi entered his classroom, eager to see what unique lesson his teacher had prepared for the day. Renowned for his storytelling abilities, the teacher was ready to guide the students through the complex topic of Indus 114, which deals with regulatory deferral accounts. As Ravi settled into his seat, he was curious about how this concept would be woven into a story. Good morning, class, the teacher began, his eyes sparkling with enthusiasm. Today, we will explore the fascinating world of regulatory deferral accounts. To make this concept more relatable, let's imagine Ravi has recently started a business providing electricity services in his community. Ravi's ears perked up. Electricity services? That sounds interesting, sir. The teacher continued, yes, Ravi. In this scenario, you are allowed to charge customers based on the energy they consume, but you also have certain regulatory agreements that allow you to defer some costs. Let's say that the government regulates how much you can charge your customers to ensure fair pricing. Ravi nodded, trying to picture the situation. So, how do these regulatory deferrals work? Great question, Ravi, the teacher replied. Under Indus 114, regulatory deferral accounts are used to recognize expenses and revenues that you are allowed to defer due to the regulations governing your business. For instance, if you incur costs to improve your electricity infrastructure but cannot immediately charge your customers for those costs, you can recognize these costs as regulatory deferral accounts. Ravi looked intrigued. So, I can record these costs even if I am not charging my customers right away? Exactly, the teacher confirmed. This accounting treatment allows you to match your costs with the revenues you will eventually earn. It helps ensure that your financial statements reflect the true economic impact of your activities. Could you give me an example, sir? Ravi asked, leaning forward in his seat. Certainly, the teacher replied enthusiastically. Let's say you spent 2 million rupees on upgrading the electricity grid, but the regulatory body permits you to recover these costs over the next five years through customer charges. You can recognize this 2 million rupee expense as a regulatory deferral account on your balance sheet. As you collect payments from your customers, you will gradually transfer these amounts from the regulatory deferral account to your income statement as revenue. Ravi's eyes widened as he connected the dots. So, I can show that I have incurred these costs, but I don't need to immediately impact my profit or loss? Precisely, the teacher replied. However, it's important to note that the regulatory deferral account should only be recognized if it meets specific criteria set by Indus 114. This includes demonstrating that the recovery of the costs is probable and that the deferral is approved by the relevant regulatory authority. Ravi pondered for a moment and then asked, what happens if the regulatory body changes its mind about recovering those costs? Another excellent question, the teacher responded. If the regulatory environment changes or if you determine that recovery is no longer probable, you will need to recognize the regulatory deferral account. This means you will have to recognize the loss in your income statement. It's essential to stay updated on regulatory changes and manage your accounts accordingly. As the lesson progressed, Ravi felt increasingly confident about Indus 114. He understood the importance of regulatory deferral accounts in accurately representing the financial position of his electricity business while complying with regulatory frameworks. By the end of the class, the teacher summarized, remember, regulatory deferral accounts allow businesses like yours to match costs with future revenues, ensuring transparency and fairness in financial reporting. This practice is crucial in industries where regulations play a significant role in determining pricing and cost recovery. As Ravi left the classroom that day, he felt enlightened and equipped with valuable knowledge about regulatory deferral accounts. He was ready to apply these principles to his electricity business, ensuring that he could navigate the complexities of financial reporting while adhering to the regulations governing his operations. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny afternoon, Ravi walked into his classroom, filled with excitement for the day's lesson. His teacher, known for his remarkable storytelling skills, was eager to unravel the intricacies of Indus 115, which focuses on revenue from contracts with customers. As Ravi settled into his seat, he wondered how his teacher would make this complex topic come alive. 
Good afternoon, class, the teacher began, a twinkle in his eye. Today, we will delve into the world of revenue recognition through the lens of a story. Imagine that Ravi has started his own mobile phone accessories business, creating and selling unique cases and charges. Ravi perked up, intrigued by the connection to his own aspirations. That sounds like a fun business, sir. Indeed, it is, the teacher continued. Now, as Ravi embarks on this entrepreneurial journey, he needs to understand how to recognize revenue from the contracts he enters into with his customers. Under Indus 115, revenue is recognized when control of the goods or services is transferred to the customer, and this is determined through a five-step process. Ravi listened intently as his teacher explained the first step. The first step is identifying the contract with the customer. Let's say Ravi has received an order from a local store for 100 mobile phone cases. This order constitutes a contract, as it outlines the specific terms, including the price and delivery timeline. Got it, sir. What's the next step? Ravi asked, eager to learn more. The second step is identifying the performance obligations in the contract, the teacher elaborated. In this case, Ravi must fulfill the order by delivering the cases. However, if he also promises to provide a warranty for the cases, that warranty is considered a separate performance obligation, as it provides additional value to the customer. Ravi nodded, absorbing the information. What's the third step? The third step is determining the transaction price, the teacher explained. This is the amount Ravi expects to receive for his products. If the store agrees to pay 10,000 rupees for the 100 cases, this becomes the transaction price. However, if Ravi offers a discount, he must factor that into the final price. Interesting. I see how this works, Ravi said, his enthusiasm growing. The fourth step involves allocating the transaction price to the performance obligations, the teacher continued. If Ravi's contract includes both the cases and the warranty, he would need to allocate a portion of the 10,000 rupees to each obligation based on their standalone selling prices. This ensures that the revenue recognized reflects the value of each component. Wow, that's quite detailed, Ravi exclaimed. And what's the final step? The final step is recognizing revenue when the performance obligations are satisfied, the teacher said, his tone encouraging. Once Ravi delivers the cases to the store and transfers control, he can recognize the revenue in his financial statements. If the warranty extends over a year, he would recognize the revenue for the warranty separately as he fulfills that obligation over time. Ravi's eyes widened as he grasped the process. So, I need to keep track of when I deliver the cases and when I provide warranty services to recognize the revenue correctly, exactly, the teacher affirmed. Understanding this five-step model will help you ensure that your financial reporting aligns with Indus 115. Proper revenue recognition is crucial for accurately portraying your business's financial performance. As the lesson drew to a close, the teacher emphasized, remember, Ravi, recognizing revenue is not just about recording numbers, it's about understanding the underlying contracts and the value provided to your customers. This knowledge will empower you as an entrepreneur to manage your business effectively. With a newfound understanding of Indus 115, Ravi left the classroom feeling inspired. He was excited to apply these principles to his mobile phone accessories business, ensuring that he could accurately recognize revenue and present a clear financial picture of his venture. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a bright afternoon, Ravi entered his classroom, eager to see what captivating lesson his teacher had in store. Renowned for his unique storytelling skills, the teacher was ready to explore the complex topic of Indus 116, which pertains to leases, replacing the earlier Indus 17. Ravi was curious about how this concept would be conveyed through a story. Good afternoon, class, the teacher greeted, his voice warm and inviting. Today, we are going to learn about leases through a story. Imagine that Ravi is starting a small cafe in his neighborhood. To get his cafe up and running, he needs a space to operate. Ravi's interest peaked as he pictured himself as a cafe owner. What kind of space does he need, sir? The perfect spot for Ravi's cafe is a quaint little place on the corner of a busy street, the teacher continued. However, instead of purchasing the property, Ravi decides to lease it for a period of five years. This decision allows him to conserve his funds for other aspects of his business, like equipment and inventory. Ravi nodded, understanding the practicality of leasing. So, how does Indus 116 come into play? The essence of Indus 116 is that it significantly changes how leases are accounted for in financial statements, the teacher explained. Under this standard, when Ravi signs the lease agreement, he needs to recognize a right-of-use asset and a lease liability on his balance sheet. 
This is different from Indus 17, where leases were classified as either operating or finance leases. Can you explain that further, sir? Ravi asked, intrigued. Of course, in our case, once Ravi signs the lease, he must calculate the present value of the future lease payments, the teacher elaborated. Let's say the annual lease payment is 1 lakh rupees, payable at the end of each year. Ravi must discount these future payments to determine the total lease liability he will recognize on his balance sheet. Ravi's brow furrowed slightly. What about the right of use asset? The right of use asset represents Ravi's right to use the leased space during the lease term, the teacher continued. He will initially recognize this asset at the same amount as the lease liability, adjusted for any prepaid lease payments or initial direct costs. This reflects the economic reality that Ravi controls the leased space for the duration of the lease. That makes sense, Ravi said, beginning to grasp the concept. What happens over the term of the lease? Great question, the teacher replied. As time passes, Ravi will need to amortize the right of use asset and recognize interest expense on the lease liability. Each month, he will account for depreciation of the right of use asset and interest expense on the outstanding lease liability. This approach aligns the expense recognition with the period over which he benefits from the lease. So, how does this impact my financial statements? Ravi inquired. The impact is significant, the teacher emphasized. By recognizing the lease liability and right of use asset, Ravi's balance sheet will more accurately reflect his financial position. His cafe will appear more leveraged, showing that he has both an asset and a corresponding liability. Additionally, this new treatment under Indus 116 provides more transparency regarding a company's leasing activities. As the lesson progressed, Ravi began to appreciate the importance of Indus 116. So, leasing can affect my profitability and financial ratios, right, he asked. Absolutely, the teacher affirmed. Understanding this standard will help you make informed decisions about leasing versus buying assets and allow you to present your financial position accurately to stakeholders. As the class concluded, the teacher summarized, remember, Ravi, the key takeaway from Indus 116 is that it emphasizes transparency and accountability in lease accounting. By recognizing the right of use asset and the lease liability, you will ensure that your financial statements accurately reflect the realities of your cafe business. With a newfound understanding of leases, Ravi left the classroom inspired. He felt ready to take on the challenges of managing his cafe while keeping track of the lease and its implications on his financial health. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a breezy afternoon, Ravi walked into his classroom, excited for another engaging lesson from his teacher, known for his storytelling abilities. Today, the topic was Indus 119, which deals with service concession arrangements. Ravi was curious about how his teacher would weave this complex concept into a story. Good afternoon, class, the teacher greeted, his smile infectious. Today, we will explore service concession arrangements through a narrative. Let's imagine that Ravi has taken on a project to develop and manage a public park in his community. Ravi's eyes widened with interest. A park? That sounds fun. Indeed, it is, the teacher continued. In this scenario, the local government has awarded Ravi a service concession arrangement. This means that he has the right to develop, operate, and maintain the park for a specified period, let's say 20 years. During this time, Ravi will provide park services to the public, such as maintenance, facilities, and recreational activities. Sounds like a big responsibility, Ravi said, absorbing the information. Absolutely. However, there is a catch, the teacher explained. While Ravi has the right to operate the park, the local government still retains ownership of the land. According to Indus 119, Ravi needs to account for this arrangement in his financial statements. Okay, but how does he do that? Ravi asked, intrigued. The first step is recognizing the financial asset or intangible asset related to the service concession, the teacher elaborated. If the government has provided Ravi with the right to charge users for accessing the park, this generates revenue. In this case, Ravi would recognize a financial asset reflecting his right to receive cash flows from users, such as entry fees and rental income from events. Ravi nodded, understanding the connection. And what if the government subsidize some of the costs? Great question. If the government provides Ravi with a construction or operating grant to support the park's development, he must recognize an intangible asset, the teacher clarified. This intangible asset represents the rights granted to him under the service concession arrangement. For instance, if the government contributes funds to build a playground, Ravi would record this as an intangible asset on his balance sheet. That's interesting, sir. What about the expenses? 
Ravi inquired further. Ravi will also incur expenses while managing the park, the teacher explained. According to Indus 119, he will need to recognize these expenses as they are incurred. For example, if he hires staff to maintain the park or purchases equipment, these costs will be reflected in his profit and loss statement. Ravi thought for a moment and then asked, how does this affect my overall financial position? The impact is significant, the teacher said. By recognizing the financial and intangible assets, Ravi's balance sheet will show a clearer picture of the value derived from the service concession arrangement. Additionally, he will need to ensure that his revenue from user fees and grants is accurately reported, reflecting the arrangement's economic reality. Wow, that's a lot to consider, Ravi acknowledged. What if the arrangement ends? How do I account for that? When the service concession arrangement expires, Ravi will need to consider the value of the assets and any remaining obligations, the teacher continued. If he has invested in developing the park, he must assess whether he can recover those costs. Any remaining value in the financial or intangible asset should be accounted for appropriately. As the lesson concluded, the teacher summarized, remember, Ravi, Indus 119 emphasizes transparency in service concession arrangements, ensuring that both the public sector and private sector entities can account for their rights and obligations accurately. This understanding will enable you to manage your project effectively while presenting a clear financial picture. With newfound knowledge of service concession arrangements, Ravi left the classroom inspired. He felt prepared to take on the challenge of managing the park, ensuring that he could account for every aspect of his venture accurately. Please share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon to get notifications. On a sunny morning, Ravi entered his classroom, eager to learn from his teacher, who was famous for his engaging storytelling approach. Today, the topic was Indus 120, which focuses on accounting for government loans. Ravi was excited to discover how his teacher would turn this subject into a captivating narrative. Good morning, class, the teacher greeted, his voice full of enthusiasm. Today, we will explore government loans through a story. Let's imagine that Ravi has a dream of opening a sustainable bakery in his community. To start this venture, he needs financial support, and he decides to apply for a government loan designed to promote small businesses. Ravi leaned in, intrigued by the scenario. That sounds like a great opportunity, sir. But how does the loan work? The government approves Ravi's application and provides him with a loan of 5 lakhs rupees at a lower interest rate than usual, the teacher explained. This loan will help him purchase equipment, ingredients, and cover initial operational costs. However, the terms of the loan include specific conditions that Ravi must meet to qualify for loan forgiveness after five years. Loan forgiveness? How does that work? Ravi asked, his curiosity piqued. Good question. Under Indus 120, when Ravi receives the government loan, he must recognize it as a liability on his balance sheet, the teacher elaborated. The loan amount represents a financial obligation, and he must pay it back over time, typically with interest. However, since this loan is specifically designed to encourage entrepreneurship, the government may offer favorable terms, including a lower interest rate or possible forgiveness if certain conditions are met. Ravi nodded, beginning to grasp the concept. So, how does this affect my accounting? Once Ravi starts using the funds, he must keep track of the loan's interest expense, the teacher continued. Each month, as he makes payments, he will record the interest expense in his profit and loss statement. However, if he meets the criteria for loan forgiveness, he can recognize that portion of the loan as a government grant. Interesting. So how do I account for the grant? Ravi asked eagerly. If Ravi qualifies for loan forgiveness, he must assess the amount he can recognize as a grant, the teacher explained. According to Indus 120, he will record this grant as income in his profit and loss statement, which will help reduce his overall expenses. This recognition helps reflect the financial support he received from the government accurately. Got it. But what if I don't meet the conditions for forgiveness? Ravi inquired, a little concerned. If Ravi does not meet the criteria, he must continue to repay the loan and recognize the associated interest expense as it accrues, the teacher reassured him. This ensures that his financial statements remain accurate and reflect his obligations. As the class progressed, Ravi became more engaged in the discussion. What happens when the loan is fully repaid? Once Ravi has fully repaid the loan, he must remove the liability from his balance sheet, the teacher explained. At that point, he will have a clearer picture of his financial position, showing that he no longer has that obligation. If he was able to recognize any portion of the loan as a grant, it would also contribute positively to his profit and loss statement. 
As the lesson came to an end, the teacher summarized, Remember, Ravi, India's 120 emphasizes transparency and accountability in accounting for government loans. Understanding how to recognize these loans and any potential grants will help you manage your bakery's finances effectively while complying with accounting standards. With a newfound understanding of government loans, Ravi left the classroom inspired and confident. He felt ready to embark on his journey to open the sustainable bakery, equipped with the knowledge to navigate the complexities of financial accounting and government support.